Kit moved to Honeysuckle Hills to find his missing brother in a town brimming with secrets. Although it's terrible timing and the stakes are so high, can Kit find love? Kit was never the alpha son his mother wanted. He was far more interested in wearing makeup and dyeing his hair. He long ago gave up hope he could find his missing brother, but new information causes things to fall into place. Maddie moved across the world to get away from the pressure of being the perfect Omega. Now thousands of miles away, Maddie is happy with his apiary in a small town where no one knows who he really is. When Kit, the intriguing owner of AB and Amp, B, shifts from his bare form in front of him, more than just his feelings for Kit get turned upside down. Can Maddie overcome his shock that shifters exist and see what's between them, or is watching his crush turn into a bear a step too far? From best-selling author Amara Sky comes a spicy MM shifter romance featuring ABO dynamics and a guaranteed happy ending. Check author website for a list of tropes. Kit. I don't like this. I don't like this at all. It's taken me years to get my life in Honeysuckle Hills off the ground. I knew I was an outsider from day one, I talked differently, dressed differently, and had significantly fewer opinions on regenerative farming techniques than everyone else, but here I am. I have friends, and a business, and a life. The time and energy I've put into keeping myself off Norman's radar is not something I want to throw out the window. But, most shifters know how to take care of themselves, to stay out of sight. Jack thought, bless his soul. He's still like a puppy, all gangly limbs and big, soft eyes. I didn't know I had a maternal bone in my body, but apparently, I do and Jack brings it out in me, even if we are roughly the same age. He only wants to be cared for. The thought of him winding up as a prisoner in Norman's side business makes my fingertips itch. My brain is flooded with images of deep, violent claw marks tearing through the bastard's face. He can touch Jack over my dead but still impeccably dressed body. So, here I am, ready to swallow my pride and ask for help. It's been too long, anyway. I've been selfish. Shifters are fighting and dying, and I'm here drinking herbal tea and telling myself there's nothing I can do. Not wanting to jeopardize my comfort isn't a good enough excuse for my inaction. The phone rings and rings, and I try not to shift my weight from side to side as I anxiously wait for an answer. Eventually, someone answers. It's a voice I don't recognize, and I have to give my name, my birth name, of, several times, as well as answer a barrage of inane trick questions, before they put me through. Please hold the line. The council head will be with you shortly. While some ominous hold music plays, I take a deep breath. I can do this, I can do this, I can do this. I am an adult, and I am not afraid. Finally, the line clicks on, and a voice answers. Hello, mother, I say, trying to keep my voice from shaking, I need your help. Maddie. It's been a long fucking day. It's nearly the end of September, which means I'm finally almost done with the honey harvest. It's a grueling time of year, so I try to hire a few guys to help me with it, but the responsibility falls back on me. They're my bees, and I need to make sure I take exactly the right amount of honey not to short them over the winter. And then, once that's all done, comes everything else. I sell honey wholesale to other businesses in the area, mostly. And now that we have the new meter in John, my stuff is more in demand than ever. But wholesale is more about maintaining good relationships with my neighbors. My real profit comes from crafts. It's the stuff I can make myself slap on some pretty packaging and then sell to the tourists for a ridiculous price. So winter is normally my favorite time of year. I get to stay at home and relax in the crisp winter air, alternating between crafting, cooking and taking my breaks to go ice fishing outside of town. But this year seems different. I'm antsy, nervous in the run-up to winter instead of my usual calm. So perhaps it's that, rather than the shitty, Busy day I'm having, that's making me lose my cool in the storeroom of Kits B and Amp, B. Fuck! I shout, shaking out my hand where I caught my fingers underneath a gallon bottle of honey. I just have to get through this. This is my last delivery of the week. Once I finish this, I can go home and get a damn drink. 
The new contracts I've developed this year are great, but the pressure of it is mounting already and it's giving me a headache. Geez, Maddie, Kit says as they breeze in through the kitchen doors, who lit the fuse on your tampon today? Really, Kit? I don't even try to keep the annoyance out of my voice. Would you prefer something about a bee in your bonnet? They stare at me, smug as all get out, but I can tell there's a tension underneath the glib attitude. You seem tense, Kit, I regret how snide I sound before I even say it, was someone too smart to take a bite of your poison apple? They roll their eyes at me and start futzing with something on the shelves. It doesn't seem like they're actually doing anything, so I assume they want me to press them into saying something. It's like this a lot when I'm at the B and Amp, B, Kit vacillates between acting disgruntled and playful teasing, while also seeming weirdly interested in getting me to be a sounding board for whatever issue they're working on. I turn away and continue stacking up the supplies on the shelves as I unbox them. I've got a case of tiny, specialty honeys kit sells in the lobby, and I have to make sure they're arranged in the storeroom just right, or it'll make my skin itch for the rest of the day. Keeping my eyes off of them gives them the space to unwind a little, and I can almost feel them slump as they let out a deep sigh. My mother is here. I try not to sound as surprised as I am when I open my mouth. Mother? Huh. I'd always assumed you were hatched from a pool of lava under the full moon, like all the other gargoyles. Hilarious, Manny. Why is she here, though? I let myself be serious for a moment. I don't think I've seen you have a single family member visit since I've known you. Kid huffs out a humorless laugh, and I let myself turn around to look them in the eye. They're glamorous, as always, with midnight blue hair, matching eye makeup and a clean, well-fitted suit, but they also seem more wrung out than usual. Something must really be going on. They wave my question off, even though there's still tension in their voice. It's family stuff. It's nothing. Hopefully, it won't take her long to get what she came for. And then there can be some peace and quiet around here again. Ouch, I commiserate, if she's staying here, that's some close quarters. You have my sympathy. Kit, what the fuck is your fucking mother doing talking to me about clan politics dash I can hear Nikolai before I can see him, storming through the swinging doors like the cavalry. He freezes when he sees me, though. Maddie, I... Uh, didn't realize Kit wasn't alone back here. Sorry. I shrug, because it's no big deal. I'm much more focused on trying to figure out what he meant by clan politics. Nikolai is hovering awkwardly, looking between us as if he really wants to say something but suddenly can't. Kit sighs, standing up straight from the wall they were leaning against, arms crossed over their chest. I told you already, Kolya, she knows what she knows and I can't control her. Fuck, I can't even keep her from criticizing all my damn China. As if she gives a shit. Kit shakes their head, and that tension is worse than ever. Nikolai says nothing in response. They stand there, staring at each other for a moment. I don't know what's going on. He runs his hands through his hair, dark and thick, long enough to fall in his face constantly and need to be pushed back. He's slim but muscular, and even though he's an alpha, there's always been a softness to him I could never quite place. In that way, he reminds me of Kit. Anyway, Kit continues, I have blessedly been invited to crash with Jack and William for a couple days, because even hanging out with smug newly mates is better than letting that woman crawl under my skin for one more day. I need some fresh air. Hold down the fort here, my love. Nikolai glares at Kit, who responds with the most dramatic set of puppy dog eyes I've ever seen. They hold for at least 10 seconds before I can see Nikolai break. Yeah, yeah, okay, he sighs, but you need to tell her that the next time she tries to talk to me about any of that stuff, I'm kicking her out on her ass. Whether she's your mother or not. He looks exactly as stressed as he did when he swept in as he turns and sweeps back out of the storeroom. Kit says nothing after he leaves. They hang their head, gaze on the ground and radiating sadness. This is miles away from the kit that I know. The kit that's so fiery and doesn't take shit from anyone. Whatever's going on, it must be something real, because Kit looks broken. Are you and Nick fucking? 
Zero thought went into that question before it popped out of my mouth. I am such an idiot sometimes. Kit's face lifts sharply to meet my eyes. They seem genuinely confused, and I already regret everything about this conversation. No, they say slowly, why would you? I don't know. There was a weird, tense vibe in the room. I mean, he's a handsome guy. You're both ridiculously pretty, actually. It'd be a good fit. It's none of my business, I know. I was just curious. Kit squints at me for a second, contemplating their response. Finally, before they speak, a smile creeps over their face. Maddie Jacobson, did you just say that I'm pretty? Was that an actual, human compliment, heard with my very own ears? I didn't even know that word was in your vocabulary. I always assumed the most effusive compliment you had in your arsenal would be you look like you'd be good at hunting moose. I roll my eyes and shake my head, finally standing up from my crouch now that everything's unpacked. Ah, there's the asshole I know. Good to see you, kid. Time for me to go somewhere. People are actually nice to me. They wave dismissively with one hand. I can see that Kit's already moved on from our conversation. They seem like they're a million miles away. Huh. I wonder if I'll ever know what this is about. I run out of energy to keep thinking about it on the way home, though. It really has been a long day. If Kit wants to tell me something, they will. It's not like I'm really their friend, anyway. Kit. Jack is freaking glowing. All the time. I mean, he's blossomed into this beautiful, shining human being ever since he got here, but since he's been pregnant, it's really kicked up a notch. He smiles all the time, and I can see the dirty fingerprints of his traumatic childhood getting wiped away, bit by bit. We've been close, he and I, since he moved in with William. He's never had the chance to be around other shifters, and I needed to teach him the ropes. Most of the other shifters in town are so deeply entrenched in their privacy they wouldn't even let me introduce them. Nikolai being the prime example of that. So, I'm all Jack's got. I gave him scent blockers so he wouldn't be detected in public as easily. The way his eyes widened and how much they cost was adorable, but also clued me into why he didn't have them already. He's pretty laconic, which fits with his past, but I figured out quickly that he hates being alone. He's probably had enough of it for one lifetime. Whenever he's around his alpha, they're always touching, he hovers close to William, tugging the bottom of his shirt into his fingers to worry at it, or nudging his nose into his alpha's neck to send him. William gets it. He takes good care of Jack. He's always petting and stroking his Omega, smiling softly at the way Jack always leans into the touch. But they can't be together all the time, no matter how hard they try, so I've tried to keep Jack company. He rattles around that big farmhouse by himself sometimes while William's at work. I'll come over and shoot the breeze, always ready to listen to the sound of my own mellifluous voice, and it seems to set Jack at ease. Now, with a belly full of pups, everything is more intense. He seems even happier, constantly rubbing at his belly and smiling, but also more prone to panic. When William is gone too long, or some sound or word reminds him of something painful, I can see all the color drain from his face, like he's about to snap and bolt at any second. All of this is to say, I've been spending some time with the boy. So, when he offered to let me stay with him to escape the prison warden that spawned me, I didn't hesitate to say yes. But I quickly discovered that Jack and William, at home, are a lot to deal with. The house smells like smug contentment all the time, which should be nice, but seems to make me bitter. Then my scent turns bitter, and the acrid tinge of resentment makes the entire atmosphere palpably uncomfortable. The boys have been polite enough not to say anything, but I know they've noticed. It's also given me more time to see Jack in his private moments, which has been much more painful than I expected. I knew from the start that the scrappy Omega was filling a coal-shaped hole in my heart. Just because I never talk about my baby brother ever doesn't mean I haven't thought about him every damn day. And Jack is so much like him, with his easy smile covering up a cautious, anxious disposition. Always quick to joke, always quick to blame himself. 
never really fitting in a world obsessed with gender stereotypes because masculine omegas apparently give everyone the heebie-jeebies. Normally, seeing Jack helped with the ache that still lived in me. It was like I was seeing what Cole should have gotten to have. I know I had a hand in keeping at least one omega safe. But now it's around me, all the time, and it's making me emotionally threadbare. Every soft, private smile he gives William makes me think of the fact that Cole would never have a mate. And every time Jack whispered nonsense or sang to his unborn pups makes me picture the nibblings I would have had if I had taken better care of my brother. It's like a constant scratching, a blunt scrape at the back of my brain, and it's making me completely fried. What's worse, my mother can definitely tell. She keeps looking at me with those piercing silver eyes, all hard edges and royal confidence. So I'm still here, trapped, with nowhere else to hide. This, though, this is the final straw. It's not their fault. It makes sense. They thought I was out, and I was out. I left Jack alone for a few hours to check on the B and Amp, B, and I thought William was in the fields. But apparently they had planned to take advantage of this quiet time, William sneaking back in after I left. So, when I couldn't take my mother staring for one more second and came home early. Fuck, Alpha, Jack gasps, his voice reverent, don't stop. Breed me up with more pups so I can make milk for you forever. His head is thrown back, eyes closed, an expression of calm ecstasy on his face. My view is side on, so I can see everything. Jack is sitting on the kitchen counter, right where I normally eat breakfast, body tilted back and legs spread wide to give his alpha access. William is standing between them, rolling his hips to thrust up into Jack, the muscles of his back and ass rippling with strength and a trail of slick and semen dripping down from where they're joined. He's making thick, moaning sounds as he picks up the pace, making Jack jerk with every thrust. What I wasn't totally expecting was his mouth on his Omega's tit. Jack is holding one breast, the nipple stiff and pink, drooling milk while he tugs and rubs at it. William is on the other one, sucking and swallowing, drinking him down while the sticky whiteness runs down his chin and drips onto the swell of Jack's belly. He stops to nip him right there on the nipple, and Jack whimpers and clenches around his alpha. No one is touching Jack's cock where it's trapped between them, but it's truling pre-cum and the trembling that's taking him over makes me think he won't need any help to come. Yeah, this is more than I needed to see. I shrink back, as quietly as I can, although I don't think these two would stop even if an earthquake hit. They're so wrapped up in each other. I shoot off a quick text thanking them for having me, but saying that I have to get back to the B and Amp, B. Then I hustle out the door. The sound of flesh slapping against flesh at a rapid pace, while Jack screams, suck me, Alpha, is my parting gift. Outside, I take in a deep breath to let the fresh air clean the fog of pheromones and happy mate stench out of me. Yeesh. It's been way too long since I've had sex, but I don't remember it ever smelling quite that intensely. Speaking of which, I notice a twitch in my pants and realize that not only did I just accidentally violate the privacy of my best friends, but apparently I got off on it. My long-neglected cock is rock hard, and today I went commando. I'm wearing soft, lightweight pants that normally make my junk look as ambiguous as the rest of me, but are too thin to cover anything once I'm hard. All I need to do is glance down to see the bulge where it lies against my thigh. It's thick and long, a real horse cock, as my old world uncles used to say. Before I confuse them all by deciding I also like glitter and eyeliner, of course. I've been too distracted by recent events to even think about sex, and I was avoiding the subject long before that. I can't remember the last time I got truly hard. It throbs painfully, and I can tell I'm about to lose all executive brain function. See this, this is why I try to focus on other things instead of letting the monster do all my thinking for me. I have to relieve the pressure. It's killing me. But fuck, not right in front of their house like a pervert. Instead of getting into my car, where someone might see me, I walk into the woods. I head away from William's trees and hide myself in the small copse that separates his orchards from Maddie's bee, fields, or whatever. 
My hand has a mind of its own, and I realize that I'm stroking myself loosely through the fabric of my pants even as I walk. There's a slight bump where my knot is already forming, and I'm compelled to give it a squeeze. The sensation hits me like a brick wall. It's been so long. I hiss out a breath, and a blot of precum pulses from the tip. Shit! I whiffle out the fabric to avoid getting a big, wet cum smear all over my crotch. I am not going home looking like a horny teenager who just spunked themselves in the school bathroom. I'm taking care of this right now. I find the least dirty looking tree and give a last glance around to make sure I'm out of sight. I lean against it, wanting to get this over with quickly. One hand reaches in and I touch myself, skin to skin, making myself sigh a breath of relief. I push down my waistband and let my cock spring free. It's already purpling at the tip, hot in my hand and leaking. The overwhelming sex drive I have fought for years is apparently back with a vengeance. I strip myself, my hand loose, leaning my weight into the tree trunk and gasping with the rush of it. Not that I'm attracted to Jack or William, obviously. But watching Jack bouncing on his alpha's cock, seeing the familiar hunger in William's face as he mounted and claimed what was his, wringing every drop of juice he could from his omega and pounding him into the counter, it's making my inner alpha growl and thrash with need. It's been a while. I picture a lovely omega bending over and presenting for me, letting me split them in two, murmuring praise and encouragement to them as they struggle to take all of me inside them. Making them groan and cry out the way Jack did as I fuck into their hole, slick dripping down their strong thighs. I don't even know who I'm picturing, but it's someone strong, with a meaty, muscular ass to grab onto and a low, masculine voice. Someone begging me to take care of him. To use him like the dirty little cock whore he is. I can see his shoulders ripple where he holds himself up, and a scruffy, stubbly cheek as he turns to glance at me over his shoulder. My hand moves faster as my knot swells and my orgasm builds. All around me are the smells of the forest, but there's something else there, too. Something light. Like a meadow? It's familiar, but I can't quite place it. I choke out a groan as my hand, slick with precum, flies over me. Then I place the scent. It's Maddie, Maddie's scent. That's the last coherent thought I have before I lose it, pumping my release into the dirt below. I shake as my orgasm pulses out of me, gasping as I milk my knot with one hand. It's been so, so long, I forgot how much I'd miss this. I take deep breaths, trying to come back to myself, letting the tingle of pleasure fade from my body. That meadow scent is still present, though. It wasn't just my overstimulated sex nose, apparently. I should check that I'm still alone, but I don't want to. I just need one more second before I succumb to the impending humiliation. That's when I notice that there's another scent alongside it. It's something sweet and syrupy, an aroused omega. Maddie. I'm not walking with any real purpose. I just need to get out of the house. My kitchen table is covered with crafting supplies, and I have a ton of shit I need to get made, boxed up and delivered to businesses, but nothing is working today. I've spent all day sitting there, my hands becoming clumsier and clumsier, my brain becoming more and more dull. There's too much pressure. I moved here specifically to get away from pressure. I wanted to live a simple life, and instead I got carried away and turned my business into something successful, like an idiot. That old, familiar panic is setting in. All the deadlines, all the expectations. My skin buzzes and my body twitches and my brain does the thing it eventually learned to do to protect itself, it shuts down. Thoughts turn off, emotions turn off, just a blank, empty mind and a vague thrum of fear keeping my body tight. My hindbrain is all that is left with a firing synapse, and it's telling me to quit everything and run. Again. But I'm trying to be good, so instead of drinking until my body is too numb to be tense anymore, I'm going for a damn walk. I'm not really taking anything in, not looking at the trees or the scenery. They're all panic blurs moving past my line of sight, but it's better than nothing. I breathe in the fresh air and try to will my muscles to unclench. I feel each sudden jolt of pointless adrenaline dumped into my system and push through the urge to panic. It's only a few deadlines. 
No big deal. It's not a PhD committee I owe myself to, it's just a few small businesses and they will understand if I fuck up. All I need to do is breathe. This is what I'm doing when I catch the scent, walking and breathing. It's incongruous, something musky and thick in the air, nothing like the smells of fruit and grass and everything else around me. I lick my lips and focus, trying to pick apart the scent with my instincts. Whatever it is, it's drawing me closer to it, and it's also having a profound effect on my body. The panic ebbs away, draining out of me, and I can feel the knots in my muscles uncoil, one by one. I have to find the source. I follow the scent, twigs snapping underfoot and leaves rustling as I push past them. I think I can hear someone breathing heavily, and it's coming from exactly the same place as the scent. A tang of salt hits me, and my body, now relaxed, builds with a different kind of tension. It's not until I notice I'm leaking slick that I realize it's the smell of an alpha. Someone's knot is growing nearby and my inner omega whines pathetically with the need to find it. The distant, logical part of my brain wonders if I'm about to stumble on Jack and William, but I don't think so. Alpha plus Omega smells different, and I can't imagine William would be out here getting off by himself with a willing Omega at home who I know for a fact is horny all the time. I keep moving forward. When I find them, it's both completely different and exactly what I was expecting to see. It's Kit, of all people, leaning heavily into a tree and working themselves over. For a second, I'm surprised by how beautiful they are. Their mouth hangs open, wide and panting, and there's a flush creeping up their neck that stands in stark contrast to their pale skin. Eyes closed in pleasure, they seem looser and more free than I've ever seen them. Their movements come easy as they writhe and roll their hips, making hungry, wanting noises and moving their hand over their cock. And it is, it is a cock. My inner omega sits up and takes notice, and suddenly there's a current of electricity running under my skin. Kid has always been strong but slender, with an air of femininity. Not the kind of person you would expect to have a hefty nine inches between their legs. It's as thick as their delicate wrist and long, long enough that I have trouble imagining someone getting it all inside them. The skin looks soft and slick, swollen with arousal, and every pass of their hand is making the most deliciously wet sounds I've ever heard. My mouth is completely dry as I stand there, stomach twisting with want, my cock filling out in my pants and, more embarrassingly, enough slick pouring from me that I know it's going to be impossible to hide. My fingers twitch to touch myself. The urge is to finger myself, weirdly enough, like the sight of something that's stunning makes my body crave being filled. But, either way, I resist the urge. It's already weird enough that I'm completely frozen to the spot, watching my friend or frenemy or whatever as they moan with pleasure. My aroused omega scent rolls off of me in waves, making the air around us thick with it, and as soon as it hits Kit's nose, they let out a cry and come. Ropes of white pulse out of them, going on and on. So much come I can practically taste it. They keep their eyes closed the entire time, face blissed out, body trembling with each cresting wave as they massage their knot and drain themselves as I watch. Their eyes stay closed even once they've finished, and we both stand there, half a dozen feet apart, noses twitching as we scent each other's arousal. I don't know what the fuck I'm supposed to do. Kid speaks before they open their eyes, breath still coming in soft pants. I'm sorry Maddie, I didn't realize I'd stolen your personal masturbation tree. They crack and I open to peer at me, a hint of a smile tugging at their mouth. It takes a second to set in, but then I laugh. No, no, I'm sorry. I should have checked the schedule to see if anyone else had booked the space before I walked out here. The awkwardness isn't easing anytime soon, but at least we're both smiling now. Although, Kit's gorgeous cock is still hanging heavy between their legs, and I can't help flicking my eyes to it and licking my lips again. I can almost taste the musk of it from here. Naughty Omega, Kit purrs, as if reading my mind, Walking around smelling that delicious will get you into all kinds of trouble, if you're not careful. Kit takes a deep breath and stands up, stepping back from the tree and reaching down to pull up their pants. My Omega whines inside me as they tuck themselves away, and when they notice the mess on their hands, and clothes, and shoes, with vague disgust, I have to suppress the urge to offer to lick them clean. 
Get it together, Manny. You've known Kit for years and you've done nothing but fight with them. One little sniff of spunk shouldn't turn you into some desperate little breeder, begging to present. But I felt desperate. I've been so deeply in my head for weeks, the idea of letting myself go and getting wrecked is captivating. It's making me buzz with pleasure just at the thought. Kit is looking at me now, dressed but messy, stance easy and head cocked. There is a smug grin on their face, and they make a big show of eyeing me up and down. I try not to squirm under the sudden attention, but I can't help it when my breath comes heavier. My cock is full and straining against my jeans now, and Kit is making a point of staring at it. You know, I never really thought of you as an Omega, Maddie. You were always more of a semi-sentient hunk of moose meat that's good at opening jars and lifting things. But this, they take in a deep breath through their nose, this needy, quivering version of you, screaming to be filled, this is a pleasant surprise. They step towards me, slowly, movements lithe and graceful. Predatory. Would you like something from me, Omega? The sound of the word rolling off their tongue makes me tremble, and for a second I think my knees might give out beneath me. My hole twitches, searching for something to fill it. Um, um I hum, nodding because I don't trust myself to speak. Nothing makes sense right now. I don't know how I've gotten here, or if this is a good idea. All I know is that I've spent the last few weeks strung tight enough to burst and now there's a beautiful, powerful alpha staring at me with lust-blown eyes, and I want whatever they'll give me. My body is screaming at me to do it, to kneel at their feet. I think you should kneel. They stand inches in front of me, shorter than I am, but with the aura of someone tall and strong. I fall to my knees, I still train on their face. I can tell that my expression is open and wanting. Like I said, Maddie, I never really thought about you like this before. But, as you've been so naughty and watched me touching myself, it's only fair that I get to watch you do the same. Kit's voice is controlled, but I can tell from their face that they're anything but. Their pupils are large enough to swallow those gray irises and their lip trembles as they stare at me. I'm used to Kit looking at me with derision, mostly, but this, this feels like worship. Pull your cock out. My hands obey before my mind processes any of it. My erection jets out, trained on Kit, and my fingers hover tentatively. I want to touch, but I haven't been told I can. Kit takes note of this, and their whole body seems to swell with happiness. What a good boy. Their voice is smooth, and it's like warm honey dripping over me, making me feel wrapped up and content. I let out a sound that could only be described as a whimper and feel my cock twitch in response. A heavy pause hangs between us before Kit speaks again. There's a brief flicker of hesitation in their eyes, but then it passes. They look down at me and take their bottom lips softly between their teeth. I can see them getting hard again, in their pants, and they reach down absently to rub themselves. Be a good boy and make yourself come for me. Now. Come at my feet while you look at me. The edge of command in Kit's voice makes me shudder and I hurry to obey their order. My hand moves quickly. I'm already painfully hard, just from watching and smelling Kit, and the dark, feral stare they're giving me is making it worse. I worry again about whether I should be doing this, but then the pleasure hits me and the worry dissipates. My brain is shutting down in the best possible way. No worries, no thoughts, just Kit's dark eyes watching me and the build of heat in my body as I stroke myself. It doesn't take long before I choke out the words, oh, alpha, and come at their feet, just like they said. I catch myself with one hand on the ground, shuddering and breathing, until my brain comes back online. I lean back on my heels, blowing out a deep breath as I tuck my cock away. When I look up at Kit, everything goes still. Kit. So that happened. How in the holy mother of fuck did that happen? First, I was minding my business, trying to live my life and stay well away from Omegas and all my baggage. Then I tried to help Jack, which was worth it, but now my mother is here and I feel like I want to squirm out of my skin. Then, I accidentally walk in on Jack and William having some of the hottest sex I've ever seen. This leads to me jerking off in the freaking forest like some redneck. 
This leads to me getting caught by Maddie, of all people, who I don't even like, and now I have to walk around pretending like I don't know how fucking beautiful he is when he comes. This is not. Good. I fight the urge to stammer out a bunch of apologies. This is a weird situation, but I'm still myself, and I don't apologize to anyone unless I have to. Do you feel better now? I settle on, eventually. Maddie looks up at me with wide eyes. I really wish he would stand up, because I was already getting hard again watching him jerk off at my feet and now he's just gazing up at me. I don't know how I went all this time without noticing how thick and dark his eyelashes are, but here we are. Yeah, he says, a little dumbstruck, thank you. You're welcome. I nod brusque, like a businessman, and offer my hand to help him to his feet. He brushes the leaves off his knees, makes sure his jeans are zipped up properly and pretends not to stare at the outline of my half-hard cock like a starving man. We study each other for a minute, and everything only gets worse. I have the urge to touch him, but I also want to shrink in on myself and never make eye contact with him again. Maddie blows out a breath and scrubs one hand over his hair, looking up at the sky. He cut his hair short recently and shaved off his beard. It makes him more classically handsome, like a lumberjack on the cover of Men's Health instead of an actual lumberjack, but for some reason, I don't like it. Did you store your language processing centers in the bird's nest you kept on your face, and now that you've shaved it off, you've lost the power to speak? I arch an eyebrow at him and he pauses before laughing. His laughter is rich and warming, like drinking a hot toddy at Christmas while wrapped in a blanket. It's always been like that, but I just forced myself to ignore it, I guess. I've taken great care to keep all Omegas at arm's length, and it seems like all of that is suddenly crumbling under my feet. Kit, 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 always so melodramatic, he says, looking at me with a warm smile. I want to smile back, but I keep the eyebrow arched and staring down instead. It only makes him smile more. Come on, he says, tugging at my sleeve, you can get cleaned up at my place. And I think we both need a drink. Let whatever instinct-driven shit show this was get out of our system. He turns around and walks away with easy steps. I'm reminded of just how much cum is on both me and my pants, and it makes me follow him. Something about the words instinct-driven didn't sit right with me. Like we were two uncontrollable wild animals, just riding in the woods. I don't like that idea. I focus on snapping my attention back to reality. Hey, hands off the merchandise fin, I say, you can't afford the dry cleaning bills for this shirt, let alone replace it when it gets ruined with your smoke fish stench. There's a little too much of a pause between him touching my shirt and me speaking for the joke to land, but he laughs anyway. Yeah, yeah. We keep walking. I realize when we get there, I've never been inside Maddie's house before. It's nicer than I expected. A small farmhouse, nothing special, but it's homey. Lots of exposed wood and minimalist decor. There's a cozy living room with a fireplace and a comfortable looking couch. The kitchen is enormous, open plan, with bay windows giving a view of the beehives. In between the living room and the kitchen, there's a gorgeous wooden table that is obviously handmade. It's made of some dark wood and was clearly built by someone with meticulous attention to detail. It's simple, but exquisite. A work of art. And on top of that work of art is a big, steaming pile of garbage. Well, probably not literal garbage, but how could anyone tell? There are boxes on boxes on boxes, some open with their contents spilling out. There are piles of notes and diagrams everywhere, scattered with crafting supplies like ribbon and acetate. There are several crates stacked around it, and they're full of tiny little glass bottles that I recognize from the honeycrafts he sells at my place. Ah, that explains what all this is. Kind of. Jesus Christ, Maddie, I say as he kicks off his shoes and throws his jacket on the back of the couch. Have you ever heard of an organizational system? Or did Martha Stewart eat too much honey and then throw up in here? I pick at the contents of the table as I speak, trying to find anything that looks like not garbage. Don't touch that, he hisses. It is officially the closest to genuinely angry I've ever seen him, just a flash of rage across his face before he relaxes again.
mostly. I'm sorry, just, he holds out his hands and softens his voice, please don't touch any of that. I don't want to lose my place. I stare at him. Apparently, there is a system here, but the system is pure chaos. Wow! I let go of the paper I was touching and back away. I continue to move around his space, looking at everything but not touching. Maddie moves slowly at the edge of my vision, watching me. That old tension is taking up residence in his shoulders again, for the first time since he knelt for me back in the woods. Just the flicker of memory makes my blood rush southwards, so I push it aside as quickly as I can. I'm trying to think of something to say as I pointedly ignore Maddie and his mounting tension. He's staring half at me, half at nothing, his eyes going glassy. There's a set to his mouth that I don't like at all, and I have a brief urge to kiss it away. We really are down the rabbit hole, aren't we? The thing that derails my train of thought is noticing the board. It's huge, so huge I can't believe I missed it at first, but it's pushed back into the recess between the kitchen and the fireplace. It's a whiteboard that takes up almost an entire wall. I would have expected this to be messy as well, but it's the total opposite. Small, meticulous rows of writing cover it from top to bottom. There are lists of numbers, of supplies, and details of honey harvests. There are some diagrams with labels that look like ways to make the maximum number of products from the same set of components. Next to that, I can see what appears to be an entire annual fiscal report with taxes calculated. My brain is scrambling and my eyes are crossing just trying to look at the damn thing. This is some beautiful mind shit right here. Uh, Maddie, I say, casting a glance at the Omega standing behind me, just how smart are you? He blushes. This big, burly man honest to God blushes for the first time since I've known him. He scratches awkwardly at the back of his neck and looks at the ground. It's nothing. I'm good with math, is all, he mumbles. I don't think I've ever really seen him shy before either. Smart, shy, needy. I'm getting to see all sorts of new sides to this man today. We look at each other for a moment. It feels kind of like I'm seeing him for the first time. Why don't you take a shower, he suggests. I'll get you a glass of wine. Maddie. Once Kid is out of the shower, looking ridiculously swamped in some borrowed clothes, do people even wear sweatpants outside of reality TV, Maddie? I take a shower as well. I slip into something soft and then go back to sit with them. On very opposite ends of the couch. The stench of our combined release and arousal isn't gone, but it's greatly reduced, and it's making me slightly less insane. Now, Kit just looks sort of content. Intrigued as they look around my place with sharp eyes, but relaxed. I knew Kit's scent before, obviously. Their normal sharp, tangy scent, like berries ready to burst, but it's weird having it in my home. It's not like I never have guests, but this seems different but I can't put my finger on why. Kit lets out a pleased hum as they take a sip of their wine, settling into the couch. My inner Omega, who is incredibly confused about what's going on here, is soothed by it. At least I can make Kit feel at home. It's nice, but of course I'm a moron, so I'm the one that breaks the silence. What was that about? In the woods? I try to keep my face and my scent neutral as I wait for an answer. What, me masturbating? Or what we did after? Kit looks calm as ever, but there's a tremor to their voice that betrays their nerves. After. What we did. I take a large swig of my beer and try to let it ground me, but it doesn't help. I was kind of expecting a glib answer, some deflecting joke. That's what Kit normally gives me. I can count on one hand the amount of times we've had an actual, serious conversation about something. But this is different. Sitting here in my space, wearing my clothes and smelling like me, Kit looks relaxed. Like they're not posturing for the world the way they normally do. Like they can just exist. It's a while before Kit answers, but I wait. I don't know, really. I just knew it was what you needed. They let out a soft laugh and turn away from me, shaking their head. I mean, I wasn't exactly in my right mind. When I looked at you, 
you were so tense and rigid. I had the strongest urge to make it go away. I just wanted you to relax, to make you feel good. And when I did, the way you responded, Kid looks over at me, and there's a heat simmering in their eyes, it was like you melted for me. Like every inch of you was ready to submit. I'd known people who liked to be dominated before, but you, you were phenomenal. I can't speak. I know my mouth is hanging open, and words are trying to percolate, but nothing comes out. The blood has drained from my body and I feel more vulnerable than I have in years. I'm not sure that I like it. I don't know if that was what you wanted. I hope it was, Kit continues, I just thought it would make you feel better. They shrug and take another sip of their wine. Looking around the room to avoid my eyes, they give me the space to find some way to express myself. It did. Feel good, I mean. I liked it. That gets Kit's attention. We could do it again, sometime, if you wanted. Kit's voice is hesitant, but thick with arousal, and that heady scent is filling the room. They squirm slightly in their seat, and I resist the urge to do the same. Thank fuck, there's a throw pillow sitting in my lap. It's been a long time since I've fooled around with anyone. I kind of got carried away. I forgot how good it felt. I can see the moment they realize this is actual human honesty, trying to cover it up with an eye roll, I mean, I knew when I moved here, I wouldn't have anything to fuck except farmers and the occasional ripe melon, but I suppose I could make do with a half-witted lumberjack. If I were pressed. They try to sneer at me, but it comes out as something fonder, and I smile back. Sure, Kit. We can do that. I haven't had a fuck buddy for a long time either. Fuck buddies. Kit tries out the shape of the word in their mouth, and then nods, eyes boring into me. I nod back. Fuck buddies. Apparently, we just made a deal. Kit. Maddie and I talked for a couple of hours, after the weirdness of our overly formal invitation to be fuck buddies faded away. It turns out he's actually pretty easy to talk to, when he's not also breaking all of my possessions with those clumsy kin hams that he calls fists. Mostly we talked about nothing in particular, although I told him the story about what I caught Jack and William doing, and I enjoyed every second of him turning bright pink in response. We skirted the topic of sex and whatever the hell we just agreed to do. I asked him about the apiary, and he got all excited, rattling off numbers and plans and facts at a speed that made my head spin. At first, he was enjoying it, a big smile across his face, but eventually it settled into anxiety. He kept talking, kept pouring out information, but there were lines set in his face and a shadow pulled over him. I interrupt with a question, but it doesn't seem to help. So, what I want to know is when you became the Steve Jobs of beekeeping? I always figured you were some inbred, backwater hillbilly, based on the way you carry yourself, the way you chew, your mangling of the English language and the fact that you obviously buy all your clothes at Walmart and Army Surplus, I say with a wicked grin. Ahem, lands and catalog, thank you very much. I snort and roll my eyes. Seriously though, what gives? Are you actually smart? I try to level him with my gaze. He doesn't laugh or bite back, though. He just gets quiet. Maddie gets this hangdog look on his face that makes me immediately regret opening my mouth and follows it up with a haphazard response. From what I can pick apart, Maddie comes from some swanky family back in Finland. Fancy prep school, fancy overseas college, Yale, yikes, fancy career. And I thought I came from privilege. I ask him how that ended him up with him here, but I didn't get an answer. We sit in silence for a while, chewing on this new information, before he continues. I couldn't take it anymore. They weren't my family, they were my employers. I was sick of feeling like some show pony they had groomed so they could trot me out to impress everyone. It was exhausting. He lets out a deep, shuddering breath and stares off into the middle distance. I wanted to do something for myself. For once. Not what they wanted for me. You know what I mean? I do. Shit. We are verging on real talk territory here. I want to change the subject but I'm a few glasses of wine in at this point, 
so some words do slip out. Yeah, actually. My mom, you haven't met her yet, but you'll get it when you do. She's very powerful. My family is powerful, and I was supposed to be their fucking golden boy. Their prized alpha. Obviously, it didn't take, I gesture at myself and smile, but that doesn't mean I don't feel guilty. I look at Maddie again, and he seems so tired. Well, it's getting late, I say with a forced pleasantness, although me being polite to Maddie seems to make it all even more awkward. Maddie blinks and snaps back to reality. Do you want to sleep on the couch? I know you were staying with the fellas, but it sounds like they could use the alone time and I don't want to go trailing after you in the masturbation forest after dark. There's a glint in his eye as he speaks, and it makes me smile. Sure, thanks Maddie. Neither of us moves. We stare at each other, something pushing and pulling between us. Part of me wants to ask him if I can sleep in his bed. Part of me wants to tell him to kneel and suck my cock. And part of me wants to run out that door and never come back. I settle for leaning back and going to sleep. Eventually. I am woken up at the ass crack of dawn by the tornado of the frozen finished tundra. It's barely light out, but there is Maddie, unboxing things, reboxing things, organizing things, and scribbling endless notes on his ragged sheets of paper. Occasionally he actually makes a thing that he can sell, but mostly he seems to spend 70% of his manufacturing time organizing his manufacturing time, and only 30% of it actually manufacturing. I pretend to be asleep until I can't take it anymore. You know, you are allowed to spend at least 30 minutes in the morning not being productive, right? You could even sleep past dawn if you were feeling really adventurous. Maddie looks up at me like a startled rabbit, eventually he seems to remember who I am and then goes back to his endless shuffling and reorganizing. There's no time. I have orders due today, and I also had this amazing idea for something to do with dried out honeycomb. His eyes are wrapped on what he's holding, and there's a laptop open in front of him with approximately 47 tabs open. Mm, I groan, stretching my aching muscles and throwing back the blanket that Maddie had given me last night. Well, why don't you do your existing orders first, so they're out of the way, and then you'll have time to research the new thing. Possibly after you consume food and water, like a functional human being. Maddie doesn't even respond. He just does this little does not compute face and then goes back to work. I absolutely, categorically, do not find it adorable. What the hell has happened to me in the last 24 hours? I look down at the baggy, ugly sweats that I'm wearing, and I shudder. Whatever I'm doing, I need my own clothes. And my hair products. And like an hour of not smelling Maddie and his stupid flowery meadow scent so I can get my head on straight. I also need to get back to the B and amp, B, someone has to make sure my mother hasn't turned my staff into a snow-covered garden of statues yet. Okay, well, thank you for the sleepover. Mutual masturbation aside, it's been a better evening than watching William and Jack exchange every bodily fluid known to man. I stand up, stretching again, and try to pull myself together to leave. I don't want to, really, but I also don't want to look too closely at why, so I brush past it. Maddie finally seems to catch what I'm trying to say and tears his focus away from whatever he's looking at on the laptop screen. You're leaving? He sucks his bottom lip into his mouth and chews on it, not seeming to notice, while staring up at me with those stupid, chocolate brown eyes. Then he stands up as well, taking a few steps towards me before he hesitates. Suddenly, I notice I'm not the only person in the room wearing sweatpants. Maddie is also wearing sweatpants. He is, in fact, wearing gray sweatpants, with no evidence of underwear underneath, and an unbuttoned flannel thrown over his bare chest. He now has my full attention. Maddie is strong and thick, broad-chested and tall, sure. I've always known that. But I've never seen him disheveled like this. It's like yesterday all over again. The abrupt difference between the easygoing, undemanding guy that I see almost every day, and the trembling, needy creature who practically screamed at me with his body how much he wanted. Now, I can see the short, dark hair on his chest and the curve of his pecs. 
There's corded muscle built from years of doing actual labor and a slight layer of softness over all that muscle, skin that I want to dig my fingernails into. My eyes rake over the strong, stubble jawline underneath his soft eyes. I can see how big his hands are, and I can see the way he's trying not to fidget under my gaze. It really is adorable. I trace the V of muscle down his hips and notice the way the fabric moves over his bulge. It reminds me of how much I wanted to taste his cock while I watched him jerking off yesterday. I can see him shift his weight from side to side, a little anxious, and something about the sight of his bare feet on the floorboards makes him seem vulnerable. The urge to care for him, to make him rest, it's undeniable. But I also want to devour him like a delicious three-course meal. The air is thick with my hungry, wanting alpha pheromones, and I enjoy the view as it sinks into him. He still looks tired, like before, and his body is still strung tight with stress, but something in him shifts and he takes a step towards me. My inner alpha preens at how sudden and uncontrolled his desire is. All I had to do was look at him. Mm -mm, none of that. I let authority use from me as I speak. I have to go home, get some clothes and get some work done. He looks crestfallen, and my alpha keens for him. But, maybe I could come back tonight, I lick my lips as I stare at him, and check to see if you got your own work done. If you want. I shrug, nonchalant, and turn to go. I can already hear how hard he's breathing. Yes, please, he says in a small voice. I turn back to him expectantly, one eyebrow raised. Yes. Please, Alpha. That's better. He obviously wants so very, very much to be good. I take a few steps towards him. His lips are parted and he seems nervous, so I don't toy with him too much. I just stand up on my toes, lean over and kiss him gently on the cheek. I think it's officially the closest we've ever been to each other, and his scent, up close, threatens to overwhelm me. I'll be back, Omega. Be good. I know without looking that he's still watching me as I gather up my things and leave. Maddie. I don't even bother to lie to myself that I'm not distracted. I was already feeling frazzled, but now my focus is whittled down to a delicate thread, and I'm pretty sure that all it'll take is one whiff of Kit to make that thread snap. But I still have shit to do, and Kit won't be back until tonight. So, instead of lying around and jerking off all day, I have to ignore the constant semi that I'm sporting and power through. I can't remember the last time I've been this horny. I've forgotten how damn distracting it is. By the time I get to my drop off and jod, I'm nearly an hour late. Fuck it, at least I got there. I have cases of raw honey to deliver, as well as a bunch of my craft samples and promotional material that'll be on display during their grand opening. I'm not sure why I'm so nervous about the opening, but at least it's distracting me from being nervous about Kit. Plus, there are other people here, so I have to put on my I'm a normal, functioning adult face and try not to draw attention to myself. I unload everything and start carrying it inside as quickly as possible. In and out, and then I can go back to thinking about what it would be like to touch Kit's incredible cock. Unfortunately, the first person I run into is fucking Norman. He's leaning against the bar, his creepy ranch manager Briar by his side. I'm sweaty and straining under the weight of an armful of supplies, but obviously they make no move to help me. Norman watches me with that smug expression he always seems to wear, while Briar pretends to ignore me, even though he's pumping out enough dominant alpha pheromones to choke us all. I try to move even faster than I was already. That little hobby of yours has become quite productive, Maddie. The sound of Norman's voice is grating as ever, but I know there's nothing I can do to shut him up. Maybe there's something to be said for the Scandinavian work ethic, after all. Even if you are all a bunch of doe-eyed socialists. Norman watches me closely, probably hoping to get a rise out of me for his own entertainment, but I'm not biting. It's a shame you people all take a vow of poverty, or I might be tempted to buy your little operation out and add it to my collection. I try but it's been a long fucking day and I can't restrain the urge to growl at him as I add another crate to the stack that I've unloaded. That gets Briar's attention, turning towards me with a growl of his own. Norman holds a hand out to stop him, like he's a trained dog. 
He still looks so smug. I can't help myself. Democratic socialism is about human compassion, not poverty, and it's the reason no one in Finland dies because they have to ration their insulin. Beekeeping is my business, not my hobby, and it makes me plenty of money to live on, thank you. I'd rather swallow a live porcupine than sell my business to a corporate scumbag like you. Also, Finns are Uralic, not Scandinavian, which you'd know if you were an educated human being instead of a living, breathing animatronic of the Monopoly man. I can feel myself get red in the face, and the oxygen tastes sweet when I finally take a breath. Okay, I took the bait, but I'm having a shitty day and he's such an asshole. Of course, all he does is laugh. I doubt he was even listening to me. What are you even doing here? I ask him, I don't think they're neo-pagan, co-op business structure is really going to mesh with your professional ethics. You know, because they actually have ethics. Norman smiles in response, and something about it is sly and predatory. Volpine. I suppress an instinctive shudder. You're not wrong there, my boy, God, he fucking irks me so much, but these filthy hippies are adjoining some of my land where there's an important access route. I'm here to explain to them exactly how swift the fiscal consequences will be if they violate the privacy of my property. He sighs dramatically, although, I should have known better than to expect people who call this a business to actually show up. I'd have left half an hour ago, but I'm relocating a significant amount of my assets to a different property this week and I don't have time to pussyfoot around. Hmm. I briefly wonder what assets Norman is talking about until I remember I don't care. Unless he's packing up and leaving for good, his business will continue to be a dark stain on this town. Briar is still silent, trying to glower at me and be as intimidating as possible. I hate to admit it, but it's almost working. He's a creepy guy. Well, as much as I absolutely loathe talking to you, I drawl, I have some more profitless hobbyism to attend to, so I'll leave you to your illegal corporate intimidation. Enjoy. I don't give him the chance to respond, turning to walk back out the door. Something about this conversation has unsettled me, but I try to shake it off. Everything he does is unsettling. I slide back into the driver's seat of my truck and try to focus on the rest of my day. It's useless, of course. As soon as my curiosity about Norman dissipates, the thought of Kit comes screaming back to the forefront of my brain. How Kit smells. How Kit might taste. Why I've known them for so long without ever noticing how beautiful they are and, most importantly, what's going to happen when they come over tonight. Kit. I can't remember how long it's been since I let myself shift into bare form. Sometimes I worry that I'm too dedicated to pretending to be human, like I'm ashamed of myself. I worked hard to let go of the shame attached to my gender and sexual identity. The idea of still being ashamed of something that's fundamentally a part of me feels like an absolute failure. Like I'm a hypocrite. But, on the other hand, there aren't a lot of bears hanging out around quaint little honeysuckle hills. It's not like it's easy to blend in. Either way, it feels good. My fur is a grayish-brown color, silvering on the face, just like everyone else in my family. Glacier bears are the dominant species back in Alaska, where our entire government is based, which makes glacier bear shifters essentially royalty. It's incredibly dumb, I know, but you can't blame me for how long it took me to escape that bubble. In the end, Cole was the reason I finally got the guts to leave. I could deal with the scorn and searing that had always been flung my way. I was the oldest, I was the alpha, I was supposed to be the man's man. The chosen son. When I tried to explain to them that those things weren't mutually inclusive, no one wanted to hear it. They were sure it was a phase, so they settled in to wait me out, and I settled in to keep my rage and resentment at a constant low simmer. Cole had been their second chance. He was masculine and so very normal. He idolized our dad both before and after he died, and imitated him in every way. Cool guy clothes, cool guy tastes, cool guy ways of moving and talking. He blended in. And I was the only one who ever noticed how performative it all was. So, when he presented as an Omega, of all things, everyone else was shocked and horrified. 
Two children, both abject failures and conforming to their gender expectations. Who would take over the world's stuffiest government now? How could someone possibly govern if they didn't fit into the exact, specific gender roles that had been arbitrarily designated to them? When it became obvious how it was going to play out, I grabbed Cole and we ran. He was 18. They couldn't stop us, and I knew I could give him a better life somewhere else. We kept moving until we ended up here, of all places, and it seemed like a peaceful way to live. Quiet, content, but not conservative or old-fashioned. It was perfect. And then we met Norman. We were new to town, we didn't know to be nervous, we just needed work. I was picking up bartending shifts, but Cole was too shy for customer service. He seemed mouthy, sure, but any kind of genuine human interaction seemed to leave him off balance. Plus, the hospitality industry has historically not been a kind career path for Omegas. Cole liked physical labor, and he was good with his hands. Practical. He started hanging out at the dirty dog, trying to make friends. He wanted to relax in a place where he fit in. He didn't, of course, as an Omega, but at least the place seemed safe. The second he met Briar, they hit it off. Briar took an interest in him from day one. It made me nervous. Of course, the guy seemed like such a roughneck. Why would I trust him around my baby brother? But I was also very aware of how sheltered our upbringing had been and how little exposure we had to anyone who wasn't wealthy and powerful. I was worried I was being a prejudiced dick, so I tried to give Briar the benefit of the doubt. He offered Cole a job as a farmhand, and the opportunity was too good to pass up. Working for the richest guy in town, no less. What did he have to lose? I couldn't accept how reckless I had been until he'd been gone for a week. I looked for him, believe me I looked, and that was how I found out the truth of Norman's secondary stream of income. But the people he took, especially the fighters, only lasted days. Especially male omegas, who drew out sizable crowds of gamblers and as many enemies as a person could have. Everyone always wants a piece of omegas. Everyone wants to blame them for something, especially if they don't fit the stereotype. The more masculine they are, the more society seems to take that as a challenge. I mourned my brother and let the guilt ferment until it became a significant part of my chemical makeup, and then life went on. Initially, I had planned to leave, but I couldn't bear the tiny sliver of hope that I might find him alive one day. Even though my rational brain knew there was no hope. I stayed anyway. And I normally avoid Norman's property like the fucking plague, but it's been a really weird week. Right now, the reckless, self-destructive urges that I normally keep a tight lid on are the ones behind the wheel. I'd gotten back to the B and Amp, B for Maddie's in an unnaturally good mood. My mother could scent that like a bloodhound, so obviously she had popped up to ruin it. Her haughty, holier-than-thou tone made me want to jump off a cliff before I even knew what she was saying to me. Kit, you're wasting your life here. You're bred from the finest bloodlines of any shifter, and you have every opportunity to succeed. All we want you to do is comport yourself appropriately. But you'd rather be here, running some embarrassing little motel like you're a normal person. Her gray eyes had stared me down, determined and fierce, and it was all I could do not to cave. Instead, I bristled. Every inch of her was getting to me, from the sharp, conservative skirt suit to the severity of how she wore her hair. She didn't even wear makeup right, she didn't consider it to be a source of happiness, it was just war paint to her. Maybe if I screamed long enough and loud enough, she would finally have left me alone. You're not normal. You're special, and that comes with obligations. Your lifestyle here is an insult to people who need you. Her stern, disappointed tone had chipped away at me, just like it always did, until I stormed out of my place, leaving her in my wake. She's lucky I didn't tell her she was responsible for Cole's death. It was on the tip of my tongue, but I held it in. I'm not sure why though. I've told her plenty of times before. Now I'm running my limbs loose, my heavy form moving perpetually forward, shaggy for keeping me warm. Whatever my weird emotional relationship with shifting is, I've missed this. Just me and the earth. 
I cover the ground between the B N amp, B and Norman's property quickly, even though I go the long way to avoid being seen. There's a brief urge to hide myself when I hit his fence line. I haven't been this close since I first went looking for coal. This is potentially very dangerous, but I let go of the part of myself that cares. I failed my family, and I failed my brother. I did my best to sequester myself away, keep the world at arm's length, but now I'd let an Omega get close to me. Which meant I would inevitably fail him, too. I should be the one to face a little mortal peril. If Briar catches me and turns me into a fur coat, that's no less than I deserve. I slip under the fence and snoop around. The longer I go without running into anyone, the more emboldened I am. In fact, the whole place is desolate. The fields are sparse, like the whole place is lying fallow. Every barn and workshop I enter, they're all empty. Equipment is gone or boxed up. Could Norman be selling? Surely, I would have heard something, if that were the case. I try to suppress the trill of joy in my heart at the thought that he might leave town for good, the fat fuck. He could just be remodeling, after all. I don't know what I'm expecting to find. Maybe an underground chamber filled with manacles or an imitation Roman Colosseum. But I come up empty-handed. Nothing. Not a. No evidence of any kind that something illegal has been going on. It makes me wonder if I had just made this thing up for all these years. Some twisted fever dream that I convinced myself was real. It sounds like something I might do. I shake my big bare head, laughing internally at how bizarrely human it must have looked. I was never a very wild bear, anyway. And I was heading deep into a spiral right now, one that I wanted to escape. Maddie. I promised Maddie I would come back tonight, and it's getting dark. He'll distract me enough to stop thinking about it. Maybe he'll want to suck my cock until I stop thinking about anything at all. That's the thought that makes me head to his property as fast as I reasonably can. I run in spurts, climbing over obstacles, and ducking around trees. I let the wind, and the fresh smells blow everything else out of my mind, and by the time I get there I'm panting, tongue lolling out of my mouth. I duck around back behind one of his beehives to shift back. I'll be naked, but I can pretend that it's on purpose or something. He already thinks I'm weird. I'm so eager to get to him, in fact, that I miss his scent in the air. I don't really hide, either I just shift. My mind is a flurry of images, every single thing I want to do to Maddie tonight. I'm using it to push down on the lid of all the rest of it. Everything else in my life that's trying to spill back into my consciousness. Just focus on Maddie, and forget the rest. It's not until I've shifted back, stretching out my naked, human form, that I see him. Maddie, right there. Some tools on the ground he must have dropped, his face frozen in shock. Mita Vitua, he says. Fuck, I know I must have rocked him if he can't even get the words out in English. No, wait, Maddie, I babble, holding my hands out towards him. He isn't moving, he's not trying to escape me, but those are the only words that come to mind. I take a deep breath and push down on the panic. He's too far away. I take a few steps closer, hesitant, trying not to spook him. Maddie, for his part, just waits. He doesn't look scared, per se. Just shocked. But he's not turning tail and running away from me either, even though he probably should. I'll take that as a win. One more deep breath. I can explain everything. Maddie. What the fuck are you trying to say, Maddie? Kid has their hands on their hips and their voice is raw, all alpha power and anger. It makes me want to shrink away and rub up against them at the same time, but I'm trying to keep my head on straight. I've had to absorb a shit ton of information in the last 10 minutes. First, I see a bear. Then it's a bear turning into a human, and the human turns out to be Kit. That right, there is already a lot. Kit promised they would explain, and led me gently back to the house, keeping their tone low and calm like I was a frightened child. As soon as we were inside, Kit was talking. They seemed completely disinterested in the fact that they were naked, so I tried to keep my focus on the words coming out of their mouth. 
and I did. But it was still, a lot. So shifters are real, not just folklore. And they live among us, and Kit is one of them. And this has something to do with their family being treated like big shots. I want to find out more, but I drop that line of inquiry the second they tell me about what's going on in Norman's. Anger is building in me, bit by bit, with every single piece of information they give me. I want to wring Norman's neck. And Briar's. And every dumb fuck that's ever given them money, and then burn his property to the ground. I'm so angry, in fact, that it takes me a minute to realize the most important part of this story, Kit is a member of the group that the evil bastard specifically targets, but somehow thought it was a good idea to go snooping around on their own. Like a moron with a death wish. Anger is not a strong enough word for what I'm experiencing. Which is how I ended up calling them a selfish piece of shit, and now they're understandably confused. I'm saying, Kit, I say through gritted teeth, that I know you have this whole give a fuck, the world abandoned me, I don't need anyone fucking persona, and that's fine, but it's also not true. You're not alone, even though you pretend to be, and there are plenty of people who give a shit about whether you live or die. Kid opens their mouth to interrupt, but I don't give them the chance. And before you start, there are people who care about you for more than what you can do for them, as well. And you owe it to them not to throw yourself into the jaws of death because of your woe is me, self-sacrificing bullshit. Kid's staring at me now. Still standing strong, still angry, but also confused. If only I could pull together what I'm trying to say. Who, Maddie? Who needs me around? There's a challenge in their voice as they lift their chin to me. I blow out a breath and let myself sag. This is so dumb to fight about. What's the point? Me, dumbass. I care about you. And I know we're not supposed to talk about it in case you burst into flames or whatever, but can you please, this once, acknowledge that feelings exist and that sometimes you and I might have some? Please. On a better day, I probably would have laughed at the face that Kit's making right now. They're speechless. Totally taken aback. But also, happy. Their eyes have a little shine to them and there's a small smile on their face. Geez, Maddie, if I knew you felt that strongly about it, I would have written you a sonnet or something. I let myself smile and relax, comforted by Kit's familiar rambling. I mean, you could write me a sonnet. And you could deliver it to me on the back of a white stallion that you rode on the beach. Shirtless. I mean, the horse will be shirtless, but you can be shirtless too, if you want. The anger drains out of the room and Kit is leaning back, looking at me with a serene smile as I step towards them. My arms wrap around their waist and I pull us close together. I don't miss the way their breath hitches, even though they brush past it. You could rent out the Eiffel Tower, cover it in rose petals, and then we can both stand on the top and jerk off, eh? That'd be pretty romantic. Their voice is quiet now, filling the small space between us and a gentle burr. I freeze, our mouths inches apart, and we both smile at each other. Kit's eyes flick down to my lips before they speak again. Are you trying to tell me you're sweet on me, Maddie? They murmur. I nod, too close to purring to use actual words. I take a deep breath and roll our bodies together, pulling a small gasp out of Kit's mouth. Well, I always said you were a dumbass. Kit laughs, but I swallow it with a kiss. This thing between us has gotten very real, quickly, but through all of it we still haven't kissed. It's about time that I take care of that. It starts out sweet and slow, our lips moving together in a wet slide, and then gets more heated. I find myself grabbing a kit, not anything in particular but just pawing at their hips and sides, fueled by the urge to dig my fingers into them and cling on. I'm suddenly extremely grateful that they're still naked. I can hear Kit hum with pleasure as they relax into me and control the kiss. One hand comes up and tangles in my hair, directing me this way and that, and they lick into my mouth with unrestrained hunger. They break away, eventually, leading me chasing after them with wet, kiss-swollen lips and a dazed expression. When they speak, their voice is a low rumble, pure sex and authority, and it makes me quiver. Your mouth is open. Are you hungry, 
pet? Mm -hmm. I'm not so much agreeing as taking pleasure in the sound of them calling me pet, but it doesn't matter either way. I thought so. Would you like me to feed you, pet? I don't know where they're going with this, but I don't care. All I do is nod and follow along. I can already feel the blissful tingle of my submission taking hold. Kit will take care of me. I trust them. Kit has moved away from me, though, which makes me pout. Alpha? I ask, but they throw a wicked smile my way as they rifle through some of the kitchen cabinets. I want you to get undressed and get down on your knees for me. I rush to comply, hitting the tile hard enough to make myself flinch as soon as I've cast aside my clothes. My mouth hangs open, waiting, and by some miracle I keep my hands off my cock even though it's begging for some attention. When Kit returns, they have a bottle of fresh honey in their hands. Room temperature, warm and sweet, ready to ooze out of the opening. I watch as they hold it up to show me until their hand slips and some honey pours out to drip down my chest. Oops. Kit looks delighted. They kneel in front of me, bending down and grabbing me by the waist. Their hands hold me still as they lick the honey off my chest, every drop, sucking one of my nipples into their mouth, hard, making me gasp and buck my hips. Shoo, stay still, pet. I keep myself as still as I can, even though I'm trembling with anticipation. Perfect. Now, open your mouth. Kit's eyes are hazy as they look at me. My mouth hangs open and they bring one thumb down to trace my bottom lip. They seem mesmerized by the sight of it. Then, they pour a generous amount of honey on two fingers. They start by smearing that onto my mouth. I can't quite taste it, but I can feel it hanging off my lips, viscous and heavy. Once they push those fingers into my mouth, I can definitely taste it. Kid has an expression of absolute, total focus as they sink their fingers in and drag the honey across my tongue. They pull their fingers out and then push them back in again. I haven't been told to, but I know what they want, so I close my mouth around those fingers and suck. Kit groans, and the sound of it is making me slick. I work even harder, running my tongue up and down their hand, sucking and slurping at the honey that's tripping down the side of my mouth. What a good, sweet little pet you are. Kit's voice is soft. They practically glow with contentment when they look at me. My mouth feels empty when they pull out their fingers and stand to their feet. But, with me kneeling and them standing, I have the perfect view of their thick cock. It's already hard, head bobbing right in front of my mouth, with a delicious-looking pearl of moisture sitting on the tip. Tempting me. Perhaps you need something more substantial, Kit says, and then oh fuck, yes, they are pouring honey all over their fucking erection. I can barely breathe. It falls in sticky amber ropes, coating that skin that already looks delicious to me. Threads of it bead down to the floor, and Kit keeps pouring until they drench their entire cock in it. Drool is already running down my chin. My mouth hangs open. Good pets do as they're told, remember, Kit purrs, you're getting fed, not feeding yourself. Understand? I nod. I'd agree to anything they said at this point. Go ahead, pet, take a little. I glance up to catch Kit looking down at me as they bring their hand to rest on the back of my head. It's comforting, like an anchor. I lean forward and flick out my tongue to taste. The flavor of the honey explodes on my tongue. I've had this honey a million times before, but this is something different. This is all-consuming. I let the flat of my tongue run over the head of their cock, dragging in the sticky coating, and listen as Kit lets out a growl of pleasure. They're staring at me with hungry, possessive eyes. I know what I must look like, down here on my knees, looking up at them through my lashes. I open my mouth wider and stick out my tongue in invitation. Kit shudders at the sight and eases themselves forward. They feed me their cock, guiding it with their hand until the weight of it rests heavy on my tongue. The weight of their cock comes to rest on my tongue and they keep moving. They sink into the wet heat of my mouth, pushing steadily further and fill my mouth with cock and honey. They stop once the head nudges against the back of my throat, but I have barely half their length inside. I try to swallow around them, throat fluttering, 
pulling a groan from them and making them push deeper into me. They don't thrust. They don't pull themselves out. They just rock gently, easing themselves further into me as I will my throat to relax. Once I adjust to the fullness of it, they move. My lips stretch as they drag their cock slowly out and then thrust it back in. Honey fills my mouth and oozes from between my lips, dragged with each thrust. Kit picks up speed, moaning and rocking their hips into my face, both hands holding my head in place. The honey, spit and precum mix in my mouth to make a sweet, salty liquid that sluices down my chin. Kit keeps going until their breath catches and they pull themselves out, trying not to come. My mouth hangs open, waiting for them to come back, and long strings of sticky liquid hang between us. Perfect, my pet. I already feel dazed, and it's hard to keep track of individual movements as Kit reaches under my arms and lifts me up with their alpha strength. They manhandle me into position, my tacky chest pushed into the kitchen table and my ass hanging off the end. Before I know what's happening, Kit's firm hands are pulling my thighs apart, and something cold is dripping down onto my hole. Mmm, -hmm -hmm, delicious, Kit says, their voice coming from somewhere behind me. Hands stroke up and down my back and knead my thighs, and then a tongue lays over my wet hole. My arousal had become something distant, overtaken by the sense of serenity that came with Alpha's cock down my throat. But this brings it back with a vengeance. My cock throbs where it's trapped between my hips and the table, and my hole tenses with the stimulation of Kit's tongue running over it. Kit pushes their face in my ass as if they're trying to devour me. Slick and honey mix to run thick down my thighs, with Kit's powerful tongue in the middle of it all, licking and sucking, working me open. My body bucks with the pleasure of it and I can hear myself making inhuman noises, just grunts and whines of need. I can't stop myself from thrusting back, trying to get their tongue deeper into me. Come for me, little Omega, they pause long enough to say, come while you fuck yourself on my tongue. A growl rips out of me, and I thrust myself back harder. Kit's fingers dig bruises into the flesh of my hips as they eat me. I can feel my hips shake, my cock twitching as the pleasure coils. Come for me. Alpha growls into my body, and that's when my orgasm catches. It pulses through me, body jerking as my hole clenches down and my release sprays across the table. Kit licks me through it with teasing, gentle touches. My hole is sensitive, and I twitch and tremble at the stimulation, but Kit doesn't stop until I'm a panting, sweaty mess. Before I can catch my breath, I can hear them grunt behind me, and then there's the wet slap of their hand working over their cock. It's only a few seconds before they come with a long, low moan, shooting stripes have come across my back and over my hole, painting me with their release. I feel marked. Owned. It's absolutely delicious. Eventually, Kit slumps over my back, shivering through the aftershocks as their knot pulses between their legs. I think my entire body is dripping with spit and semen and honey, and I want to roll around in it forever. Kit. After the world's stickiest, most glorious blowjob, things escalate pretty quickly. We're not talking about what we're doing. We're not using words to name it. It's obvious to both of us that talking about it will only ruin it. Sublimating is in everyone's best interest. What we are doing is exploring a fuck ton of ways that two people can get sexy together, especially anything that has a submissive vibe to it. Maddie never knew about kink before, but he's taking to it like a duck to water. His submission is so natural, so pure, and freely given. It's intoxicating. I know this is another thing we should talk about more, but I can't help myself. Being with him in this way blows every other thought out of my brain, and I need that right now. One day, I find Maddie even more frantic and messy than usual. He's wild-eyed and strong bowtight, and it looks like he has accomplished nothing for hours other than making himself more wound up. I have an idea. Maddie has never heard of cockworming, so I teach him. I order him to his knees in front of the couch before I settle myself in. I lean back, getting comfortable, and as I'm wearing a fetching little negligee, I only need to lift the hem to show him my soft cock. Maddie looks hungry and dives forward, but I shush him to a stop. Don't suck, my pet. Just put it in your mouth. Keep it warm for me. 
He creases his brow and looks slightly hurt, but I run my fingers through his hair to soothe him. Don't worry, pet, you'll love it. This will make me happy. And he does, of course. He relaxes almost immediately, letting his head rest against my thigh. His tongue rubs at me absently, but not enough to get me hard. Even soft, I barely fit in his mouth, and a steady stream of drool drips down his lips and onto my leg. I get coated, but it's worth it. Matty goes from frantic to peaceful in under a few minutes, and by the time I wake him from his subspace an hour later, he's turned completely boneless. Sleepy eyes blink up at me and he looks pleased. I ask him if he wants me to fuck his face, and he nods and hums, so I fuck him gently and then pour my load down his throat, while he eagerly swallows. That night, Maddie sleeps deep and peaceful. Maddie. Being with Kit is all-consuming. It's taking so much of my focus, I can't even remember to badger them about their true identity. It's been weeks, and I still know next to nothing about what shifters really are. I feel like I should care more, but I really don't. I'm much more interested in learning just how many ways they can pin me down, making me feel small and beloved. The honey thing comes up again. So does other food. One night, Kit lays me back and spreads my legs. They pour warm chocolate sauce over every inch of my cock and hole and then spend what feels like hours licking it off. They make me hold my hands over my head and not move, coming again and again until I feel like my skin is on fire. Kit. One day, I'm snooping around Maddie's room, and I find them. Panties. They're soft and pink and lacy, tucked away in a little drawer. I can picture how they must look with his hard cock trapped inside and my mouth immediately fills with saliva, while I go from zero to a raging erection faster than I ever thought possible. Maddie isn't home right now, so there's obviously only one thing I can do. I wrap the panties around my cock and jerk off until I'm coating the delicate things with my release. When he gets back, I'm eager to show him, but he blushes and gets defensive. I wouldn't have pegged him for the kind of guy to get caught up on gender stereotypes, but apparently, he can surprise me sometimes. He sulks for two days, even when I show up in a full garter set and thong, kneeling down and sucking all the cum from his cock until his eyes roll back in his head. He allows it, but he's still grouchy at me and won't talk about the panties, under any circumstances. A few days later, and he still isn't over it. I want to make it up to him, and show him what a good dom I can be. Today, I beat Manny back to the house. By the time he gets back from deliveries, I'm there waiting, looking about as smug as I feel. He steps inside with an eager look on his face, waiting for instruction. I tell him to get a timer and meet me in the bedroom. When I get there, he's practically vibrating with excitement. I tell him in my most sultry bedroom voice to set the timer for 30 minutes. And then, with a swipe of my thumb over his lips, I tell him to lie down and take a nap. He frowns at me when I leave the room but when he emerges, sleepy and warm, 30 minutes later, he pulls me down onto the couch and cuddles me to within an inch of my life. Maddie. Oh, this is going to be so bad. I can't do this. I ran as far as I could from business functions and public speaking after a lifetime of being expected to perform for people on behalf of my family. Even though I still know how to schmooze, the thought of it makes my stomach cramp. I came here for the quiet. The chance to be alone and spend time in nature. Jod is a cool business, and I'm excited to work with them, but I should never have agreed to come to the stupid opening. The fact that Kid is here is helping, though. Kind of. They had been gleeful as soon as they heard about it. Looking me up and down with a lascivious grin, they told me they would choose my outfit and that they would put me in chastity for two weeks if I refused. I'm a human being, so I'm pretty into orgasms, and like a simple-minded fool, I said yes. Now, I'm standing in the middle of a room full of people that's buzzing with conversation. I'm wearing an expensive, fitted suit that feels like a comfort blanket and a straitjacket all at the same time. It's steel gray, matching Kit's eyes, and I have no illusions it's an accident. My shoes are shiny and tight, and I'm clean-shaven, with product in my hair. I've been here for 10 minutes, talked to no one, and I'm already exhausted. 
I nurse the glass of mead in my hand and will it to make me feel better. Kit and I have both enthusiastically agreed not to tell anyone what we've been doing the past couple of weeks, so they're not actually standing near me. But I can see them across the room. They look phenomenal, wearing some kind of three-piece black suit situation paired with intimidatingly high heels. They might even be taller than me in those, and the thought makes my mouth go dry. Our eyes keep catching through the crowd, and if I really concentrate, I can still scent them. It's steadying, although it draws my attention back to the other thing they've chosen for me to wear. My throat feels thick when I swallow, and I try not to reach down and adjust myself. It'll only make it worse. Maddie! A familiar voice calls out to me, making my head snap up to attention. I can see William, looking worn out and unsteady on his feet, wearing a wrinkled suit. It's distinctly unWilliam, but he has a great excuse for it. What the fuck are you doing here, old man? I ask through my smile, ignoring William rolling his eyes at me, the pups were born, what, less than a week ago? Shouldn't you be at home, naked and nesting with your family? A pained look flits across his face, and then he sighs. I know, I know. But Jack insisted. He says I can't miss the fruits of all my labor, or something equally ridiculous. The Alpha frowns, and looks down at the empty cup in his hand. Or maybe he was making fun of me. I never quite know. Either way, I thought a drink or two might relax me, as I have to be here for a few hours, but it turns out that fatherhood is really ruining my tolerance for alcohol. He sways a little as he speaks, and I resist the urge to prop him up. He looks so lovesick for his family, all of two miles away. It's adorable. You should probably take it easy, brother. I'm sure your family will be desperate for your attention when you get home. How many pups was it? Three, a loose, goofy smile threatens to take over his entire face, three perfect pups. You should have seen Jack, Matty, he was incredible. I'll never get over how strong he can be. I chuckle again at the sweet, smitten look on his face. You have got it bad, brother. I'm happy for you. We smile at each other. A moment of quiet companionship settles over us before William blinks himself back to reality. How are you, though? I heard Kit's been using your place to escape from the family drama. Given the way you two fight, that must be interesting. He raises his eyebrow at me, and I worry that my entire face is going to turn beet red. Everything in me gets tight and awkward, and it's suddenly impossible to not see Kit's face across the room. I clear my throat, but my voice is still unsteady when I answer. It's, ah, uh, it's been good, actually. I look back at William, and he's staring at me like I just grew a second head. He frowns, obviously trying to parse something out, but I pretend like I don't know it. Either this thing with Kit will fizzle out and no one will ever have to discuss it, or William will end up finding out in the long run. Let him wonder for now. I should really check on something. It was good to see you though, I pull away, send my love to Jack and the pups. That pulls his face into a smile again. I nod once more before steering myself to the other side of the bar. There's a table here that's covered in my marketing material, and it's sufficiently in your face to make me cringe. I suddenly feel like I've created a booth at a school fair, instead of something professional. Even my name is cheesy, Viking Honey. I hate it, but someone convinced me it would be an easy hook, especially considering the elder millennials that make up this town's clientele have a huge hard-on for anything that seems ancestral. In fact, I think that person may have been Kit. That was back before we knew each other enough to hate each other. Huh. So I went with it, and all the products have words like heritage in the description. The logo is a vaguely runic-looking tree of life in a circle, cementing the fact that I am a dirty, dirty culture thief. Either way, it seems to have worked out because it drew the neo-pagans to me like moths to a flame. Now here I am, at the opening of my new partner business that's going to give me a steady income stream for a very long time. It's a rousing success, by anyone's standards. Then why can't I stop thinking about Kit? My mind should be on the fruits of my labor, as William said, 
but all I can do is focus on the prickle of the hairs on my neck as soon as I feel those steely gray eyes landing on me. The temptation to ditch this party, go home and work on taking off their suit with my teeth is incredibly strong. I turn around to see if they're thinking the same thing, but Kid is occupied with talking to an older woman. Between the woman's stern expression, gray eyes, and just how wildly Kid is gesticulating as they speak, it isn't an enormous leap for me to guess this is their mother. I'd promised Kit I would stay out of all this stuff, and I'd meant it, but right now my curiosity is getting the better of me. When are you going to realize that I'm an adult and I can make my own decisions? Kit's words, whisper yelled, drift over to me as I move closer. When their mother speaks, her voice is haughty. She's standing stiff, formally dressed, and her eyes betray no softness of any kind. She's exactly what I was expecting. Perhaps when you stop behaving like a child and throwing yourself into danger. You may have tried to throw away your birthright, but you're still my only heir and I won't allow you to be shot by a rabid appellation because you hate feeling left out. I step up to them, but Kit is too busy clenching their jaw and seething to notice me right away. This is the East Coast, mother, the Appalachians are nowhere near here. Kit's voice is snide and childish. It's not attractive, obviously, but it gives me a sudden jolt that I'm seeing a piece of the real kit. They're normally so put together, so smooth. Even when they're screaming and pouring their cum down my throat, they manage to maintain the illusion that they're completely in control. But apparently, one conversation with their mother is enough to unravel all that. It's almost cute. I think I have a dopey smile on my face as I look at Kit, and when they notice me, their eyes go saucer white. Their mouth hangs open, speechless, which isn't something I expected to see. I try not to sound smug as I chuckle, but I don't think I succeed. What's happening tomorrow? I ask. Kit's expression immediately darkens. I'm sorry. This is a private conversation between me and my son. You'll have to excuse us. I bristle at her use of the word son. It may seem innocent, but I could hear the vitriol behind it. The smile falls from my face and before I even notice, I'm turning toward her with a growl in my throat. She raises her eyebrows at the sound but seems otherwise unperturbed. Kit is my friend, and they seemed upset, so I thought I'd come see if they were alright. A tense silence builds while Kit's eyes flick between me and their mother. It's obvious the panic lever in their mind has been pulled, and I feel bad, but not bad enough to stop. I don't like the amount of turmoil this woman has seemed to drag with her in the past few weeks. Then I feel fingertips grazing the waistband of my pants, under my suit jacket, and I suck in a breath. The fingertips creep closer, one at a time, until they've tucked themselves inside the fabric. Just a few millimeters, but it's enough to make my heart pound. They move deeper, just until they can touch the fabric of the underwear that's hugging my skin, and the sensation makes me jump violently. If I didn't already know they were related, my doubts would have melted away when Kit's mother gives that same arched eyebrow. Normally, Kit saves it for the bedroom and it makes Slick run down my thighs, but from someone else it's making me tense. But Kit's creeping fingertips are still lighting me up with arousal. Tense and horny. It's been my default state since we started whatever this is, and apparently that's not going away anytime soon. Mother, you'll have to excuse us. I'd like to leave, and I'm sure Maddie here is happy to give me a ride. Bright eyes catch my gaze, and there's just a hint of breathlessness as they repeat themselves. You will, won't you? Give me a ride? The worshipful tone they use for that last word threatens to steal all the breath from my chest, and I find myself just nodding along. There's a snort beside me, and the muttered words, can't even find yourself an appropriate Omega. Look at him in that suit. It's comical. Like seeing an alpha in a frilly dress. Kit tears their eyes away from me one more time. I'm an alpha, and I'm partial to a frilly dress, mother. Now, like I said, you'll have to excuse us. I'm feeling the sudden urge to let my big, strong omega bend me over the nearest surface and split me in two. There's the sass I expected from them. A smile tugs at my lips, and I can't stop looking at them while they scowl over my shoulder at her. 
they really are the same height as me in those heels, and it is exactly as glorious as I'd hoped. I can smell a whiff of my slick in the air and I'm uncomfortably hard in my pants. Now it's really time to go. Kit withdraws their fingers from my pants and uses that hand to grab my arm and drag me away. All I catch is a glimpse of their mother rolling her eyes and sighing, and then the way they're digging their fingers into my arm pulls my focus. They drag me across the room at a breakneck pace. It's enough to draw the attention of the other guests, most of whom we know, but my erection is too busy leaking precum to care. I'm practically thrown into the truck, and it takes every drop of focus that I have to drive us back to my place. Kid is silent and rigid the entire way. I second guess myself. Maybe they really are just angry and I'm the only one who's turned on right now? Maybe they're mad at me now for not giving them emotional support instead of thinking about the tent in my pants? Fuck, maybe this thing between us is already collapsing. When we get to the house, I get out and silently trail Kid inside. Their face is still stony and unreadable, and I can feel myself shrink smaller as the shame takes hold. This was a terrible idea. I was never going to be good enough for someone like them. But the second we get inside, Kit whirls on me, shoving me into the living room wall. Their face is inches away from mine, and I can feel their hot breath on my skin as they pant. Their ferocity is equal parts sexy and terrifying, and I quiver under their hands. You are filling the room with the scent of slick from the moment I touched your panties, they growl, everyone could smell it. Tell me, are you a thirsty little cockslut for everyone that fucks you, or am I just special? The bottom drops out of my stomach, and my cock is screaming at me for attention. My mouth hangs open, speechless. Which is the perfect opportunity for Kit to fill it with their tongue. I soften in their arms as Kit manhandles me, their tongue fucking my face and eventually getting me to the middle of the room. I'm leaning into them so hard I almost stumble when they pull away. I feel the sudden loss of contact all over, but Kit is looking at me with that smug, dominant smile. I've learned by now that when they look at me like that, I need to do as I'm told, and nothing more. Hard is not a strong enough word to describe the situation in my pants. Look at you, Kit purrs, backing away as they sweep their eyes up and down. You look like you walked off the cover of GQ. All tall and strong, well coiffed, perfectly presented down to the last button. Anyone who saw you might think you were a member of the 1%. A master of the universe, conquering everything in his path. I'm too distracted by the hunger in their eyes to form a response, so I nod. But you're not, are you? Their tone turns sly, and I shake my head. No, I'm really not. You're just a needy little cockslut, full of holes and begging to be filled, aren't you? Again, there's no word of a lie. I nod. The smell of my slick has filled this room now as well, but it's overpowered by the sharp tang of my alpha's arousal. I think my pet needs to earn his fucking tonight. I put all this effort into dressing you up pretty. I think I deserve a show before I give you what you need. My hands are shaking, but I do my best to stand up tall and wait for their command. Strip for me, pet. Slowly. I've never been much of a dancer, so I don't even try. Instead, I just move steadily, pulling off my clothes one by one. They end up in a pile on the floor, suit jacket already creased, but I still focus my eyes on Kit. I pop the button on my pants, but when I go to pull them down, I hook my thumbs into my underwear as well, aiming to get them both off at once. TSK TSK TSK, Kit hisses, naughty pet. You know what I want to see. Lose the pants, everything else stays on. Show me how beautiful you are in the panties I chose for you. The word panties still makes me inwardly cringe. I never wanted Kit to find out about that particular kink. It's not that I don't think men can wear lingerie. People should do whatever makes them happy. But something about it has always felt inappropriate for me, specifically. Like it's not something I'm allowed. I don't know if it's my stiff, traditional upbringing that makes me feel that way. Maybe it's something to do with the fact that my new persona, the identity I claimed after I left home, revolves around a lot of typical rugged masculinity. Either way, it's always felt like an inexcusable indulgence. Panties are soft and pretty. 
they are practical. Their only purpose is to make me feel a certain way. It's purely selfish on my part. It's not something I'm proud of, and it's certainly not the gender-bending, psychosocial minefield that I ever wanted to see the light of day. My breath comes shaky as I drop my pants and step out of them. Kits literally had their tongue in my ass, but this feels more exposing than anything we've done together. And, of course, they picked the girliest pair of panties they could find. My skin is wrapped tight in pink lace. It hugs the curve of my hips and rides up high on my ass cheeks, nice and slutty. The front is not nearly as spacious as I could have hoped for. There's been a throbbing in my crotch for nearly an hour now, and the evidence is clear. I can see my length, thick and hard, bulging through the fabric. There's slick wetness smeared all over the front, forming a dark wet patch, and it's big enough to meet up with the wet patch covering my dripping hole. My balls are held tight into my body, and the panties are so tight that my cock doesn't even fit, and the tight, swollen head is sticking out the top, shiny with pre-cum. Kit takes in a sharp breath, and the smell of alpha arousal punches me in the face. So beautiful, Maddie, they murmur, so perfect. Look at your perfectly soaked panties, covering up all the parts of you that are straining to be touched. I want to rip them off with my teeth and bury myself in you. It's the most stunning thing I've ever seen. A wave of emotion rises and threatens to choke me for a second, but then Kit stands up and I lose focus on the bigger picture here. I want their long fingers wrapped around my length and their longer cock splitting me open. Those fingers reach down and snap the elastic, hard, and it makes me shiver. Beg for what you want, pet, they say in a low growl, and you might get it. Fingers trace over my bottom lip and then slide into my mouth, just once, before pulling out, slick with my spit. Please, I breathe. Please what? Is my slut hungry? Please fill my needy holes, kit. Please fuck your little cock slut. I've never meant anything so much in my entire life, and there's a glint in Kit's eye as they lay their hands on me. Kit. Maddie is bent over the arm of the couch, limbs splayed everywhere. His skin is flushed with arousal, and I want to lick up and down his back, but I have more important things to focus on. Maddie and I have been fucking for weeks now, and I've had the opportunity to explore every crevice of his thick, beefy body, but we haven't actually fucked yet. We haven't talked about why. I'm a little worried about my size, considering how tight Maddie is. That sounds arrogant, but it is. I've let him take the lead on that front, and so far, he seemed absolutely delighted to have me dom him into coming on my tongue or my fingers. Not to mention, he has a face that was made to be fucked. Those soft lips, that raw vulnerability as snot and tears and spit drip down him, it's addictive. But tonight, we both want the same thing. Maddie got down on his knees and begged me, voice cracking, to fuck his needy holes. His cock strains against those beautiful panties and he's more submissive and delicate than I've ever seen him before. The panties, the relief he used as he stripped off all those trappings of masculinity, the way his breath shakes every time I give him a command. I have no choice. I twist my fingers in the fabric covering his hole and rip it, the sound echoing through the room. The front is staying covered. I will never get over the way it looks with his cock spilling out from the waistband. I can't help myself, and a low, hungry sound pours out of me. Maddie's hole is dripping wet and fluttering with need. He doesn't look like he even needs to be prepped, but I'm not taking any chances. I want to stretch him around my fat cock, not tear him. My fingers fuck into him easily, two and then three, then four as he lets go and sinks even deeper into the sensation. His legs are spread, his hips open for me, and he's panting out soft whimpers with every thrust. His eyes are closed, lashes pretty where they lie across his flushed cheeks. His lips are swollen from being sucked between his teeth and he looks like something soft and beautiful from a renaissance painting. Feminine, even within his undeniably masculine body. I want to try something, but we haven't done it before, so if he doesn't like it, I'll need to backtrack immediately. Something tells me he'll like it, though. Does that make my pet feel good? Finally, something to fuck himself on? The MPH is his affirmative. 
you're so wet for me, I just slide right on in. Like an invitation. Is that what it is, your body's way of begging me to fuck you in your tight, hot cunt? I wait for him to tense, or to object, but he still looks peaceful. The fingers of my other hand trace light patterns over his ass cheeks, worshipping them, and I fuck my hand into him a little harder. Look at that beautiful pussy, stretched around my hand. So pink, so soft. Wet and wanting, all for me. Do you know how beautiful your pussy is, my pet? Human PH comes again, along with a groan of pleasure that gets buried in the sofa cushion. Do you want me to fill your pretty pussy with my big, fat cock? I wait for it, still on the fence about whether this is working for him. He nods into the cushion, but it's not enough. Use your words, pet, he cries out when I thrust my hand in particularly hard, tell me if you want me to fuck your leaking cunt. Tell me how beautiful it is. His breath is coming wet through his teeth, clenched with emotion, and he reaches blindly behind him to grab for my hand that isn't currently buried in him. As soon as I snag him, our fingers lace together, and he gives me this incredible squeeze. It feels like that squeeze speaks volumes. Please, baby, he moans, please fuck my beautiful pussy with your big, fat cock. I want you to tear me in two. A feral growl rips its way out of my throat, and I have to pull my hands away so I can spread his cheeks. I can see where the ripped lace is digging into his skin, leaving patterns, and I can't stop staring at how lovely it is while I press my cock up against his opening. The pressure is slow but steady. His skin is so tight, but it gives way beneath me like elastic. By the time I'm fully seated in him, Maddie is squirming and writhing beneath me, high-pitched cries spilling out of him, and I have to take a second to marvel at how incredible he looks. I rub my thumb softly over where he's stretched wide around me, and it makes him shudder. Please, he whines into the sofa. I pull in and out once, my breath shuddering as I move. His skin drags and squeezes me, and I can feel it working over my knot, so tight I want to scream. We keep building up slowly, but eventually I'm fucking him hard, each thrust rocking him into the couch, and he's screaming every time I nail his prostate. I haven't told him to come yet, and he's been good, but I can feel it turning him slowly inside out with need. He stopped making anything other than animalistic sounds a while ago, but I can't stop the litany of words that are pouring out of my mouth. So good, Maddie, I love how that pussy clenches around me. That's it, scream for me, baby girl, I want to hear how much you love it. I'm going to come if you keep working my knot like that. Is that what you want? Not you entrench you, breed you up, fill you with my cum? I'm going to fuck you over every surface in this house until you can't even walk. You were born to be bred on my cock. You should live on my cock. It's nonsense, most of it, but I can't help myself. He's so tight and hot around me I'm seeing stars. I never want this to end, but my knot is swelling, and I can't resist it. I thrust harder and faster, digging even deeper inside him, catching on his rim each time in a way that makes him cry out again and again. That's it, baby. Grab my knot with your pussy, pull me inside. I grunt out the words as I give one hard, final thrust and my knot pops inside. The amount that he stretches to let me in is incredible, and he comes, screaming, come filling his already drenched panties. He trembles and clenches, his muscles working me as my cum pulses into him. My fingers dig into the meat of his ass to steady myself, but it doesn't really work. My entire body is shaking, and it doesn't look like I'm going to stop coming anytime soon. Maddie's own orgasm drags out with mine, still clenching around me with every new wave. My baby sniffles and mules into the cushion while I fill him. We take nearly an hour to come down. My knot finally softens enough to slip out, and Maddie has been silent for a while now, his body boneless and only his open eyes telling me he hasn't fallen asleep. I scratch my fingers into his scalp, tugging at his hair. It's enough to spark something in him, and he pushes back into the touch with a sigh. He can take as long as he needs, I think, as I drape myself over his back again. I don't have anywhere more important to be. Maddie. At some point in the night, Kit fills me in on what they were actually arguing with their mother about. Today, 
she's taking her people, I asked Kit if I should call them soldiers, but they rolled their eyes at me and snorted to raid Norman's property. They've been collecting shreds of evidence all month and have used their political connections to get a right to search warrant. It seems wildly illegal that a private entity can be allowed to search someone's property, but corruption in this country isn't exactly news to me. I try to brush past the thought. Despite my immediate distaste for the woman, at least Kit's mother cared enough to ban them from the raid. I know a little about what had happened to their brother. The few things that have been whispered to me in a thick, pain voice in the darkest hours of the night. There's something about that quiet intimacy that makes it easier to talk. It's dark and silent, the two of you huddled under the blankets, feeling like you're the only people in the world. Outside of those moments, Kit has never mentioned a word of it, but I've picked up enough to know how much of a hole he left in their life. Which means they would be physically incapable of going to that place without doing themselves damage, physical or otherwise. I don't want them anywhere near it. They already acquiesced to their mother, even if it was grudgingly, so my mission is to keep them distracted enough that they don't get worked up and change their mind. I devote all of my energy into giving them something to pour all that pent-up energy into. Such burdens I carry. Kid is twitchy when we wake up, and tense, but I give them the longest, slowest blow job I can manage until at least a fraction of that tension has eased. They come down my throat with one hand in my hair, and they smile at me with naked affection when I look up. There's sadness there too, but the affection is what matters. I kiss them deeply, and then pull them downstairs to make us pancakes and bacon, all drenched in honey. Later on, I make a point of being just bratty enough to draw their attention. I refuse to stop, even though I'm normally pretty easily placated, and eventually all that simmering anger gets turned on me. But it's Kit, so the anger turns into a desire to control, which turns into a desire to service, as per usual. They bring me to the brink of orgasm, only to ruin it so many times I'm a weeping mess by the end of it. Afterwards, they let me lie in their lap while they hand feed me pieces of fruit, and I like to think some contentment settles in us both. It goes like that. I ignore all my responsibilities, for once, too focused on keeping Kit safe to care. Kit knows what I'm doing, so they spend the day frustrated and irritable, but at least I can give them an outlet for it that doesn't involve breaking and entering. Whatever happens, we don't turn on the news. By the end of the day, we're both exhausted, physically, and emotionally. We need to get out of the house. In an effort to stay away from everyone we know, we head to the dirty dog instead of going into town. It's loud and crowded, with a faint smell of cheap beer, but the atmosphere is cheerful, and the loud music is blowing most of the thoughts out of my brain. This was an excellent idea. Apparently, we're also both too tired to remember the rules of being in public. Until now, we've kept the touchy-feely stuff strictly private. But what can I say? It's been a long-ass day and I want to hold Kit's hand at the bar. I lean over and order us both a drink. Kit is unusually quiet, their face drawn, eyes flicking from side to side as they shift their weight. They squeeze my hand like it's a lifeline. Don't worry, I turn and murmur in their ear, these people are very live and let live. No one cares if you're wearing eyeliner. A huff of air escapes Kit's face, and the derisive glare they give me is the most emotion I've gotten in a couple of hours. It fades quickly though, and then they're back to looking drained. I wait a second to see if they'll say something else with no success. But, as soon as I turn my attention back to the bar, I hear a soft voice. I haven't been here since I came with Cole. My brain is cycling through every word in the English language at warp speed, desperate to find the right thing to say. But there isn't anything. Instead, I move closer and place a tender kiss on their temple. We lean on each other, just for a moment, and when we pull apart, I think that some of that sadness has eased. When we turn around to find somewhere to sit, drinks in hand, there's a set of eyes staring at us from across the room. Shit. I forgot Jack liked to come here. But either way, shouldn't he be at home right now? Instead of staring at Kit and me with a level of shock that makes me feel raw and exposed. It's too late to take it back now. We head over to the table and help ourselves to some seats. 
Jack continues to stare, and I refuse to let go of Kit's hand. There's someone sitting with Jack, a younger, rough-looking guy, but he doesn't seem to have any interest in the sudden tension. He sips his beer and continues to gaze at the wall with a thousand-yard stare. I thought you'd be at home with the pups, Jack. What's going on? If I sound concerned, it's because I am. I've rarely seen an Omega leave the nest this soon after birth, and especially not one that's as obsessed with caretaking as Jack. Something must be really wrong. Jack is still staring at me and Kit, frowning, but then he snaps out of it and fixes those amber eyes on mine. I was too busy having a minor meltdown to notice before, but he looks heartbroken. Something in me sinks at the thought. Are they dash? They're fine, he reassures me. William's with them. I just had to step out for a minute. Eli, he turns and indicates the man sitting next to him, who is still not looking at us, he had some bad news this morning. I wanted to make sure he was alright. Jack reaches over and slaps his friend on the shoulder, giving it a tight squeeze. Eli stiffens at the touch. He looks like every stereotype about people who live in trailer parks, unshaven with dark, unkempt hair. He's wearing a sleeveless leather jacket that shows off lean, defined muscle. The kind of muscle someone has when they never set foot in a gym but can feel dress a deer with their eyes closed. It fits the profile that casual physical contact between friends might not be what he's used to. But when I sniff the air, I realize that it's not Jack's Omega I was smelling. I mean, it is, but it's his friend as well. Hmm, interesting. Also, as much as he stiffened up when Jack initially touched him, he's softening under the persistent touch. I'm suddenly seeing what this man and Jack might have in common. I'm sorry to hear that, Kit speaks for the first time in a while, what happened? Jack waves his hand around, we don't have to dash, but Eli opens his mouth and cuts him off. M brother ran out, left town this morning. His voice is quiet and deep, his words straight to the point. His shoulders are hunched up tight around his ears, and he still hasn't made a contact with anyone at this table. His brother is Briar, he's the foreman over at Norman's place, there's a steely look in Jack's eye as he speaks, and he flicks his tongue over his lips. It looks like something got over the fence line this morning, maybe a bear. Neither of us looks at Kit when he says it. The whole place was torn apart, he continues, two of them were taken by surprise, found dead. The rest of the staff have disappeared. Eli goes back to staring at the wall with a pained expression. Jack pins Kit with his eyes. You wouldn't know about any aggressive bears in the area, would you, Kit? There's a long, tense silence, but Eli seems to be too wrapped up in his repressed emotion to notice. Thankfully, Jack and Kit are staring each other down like they're in a western, and I'm doing my best not to feel adrift in something I'll never fully understand. Or maybe you do, Matty. Jack whips his head to look at me. Have you seen any bears around? I take a deep breath and let it out slowly. There's too much tension at this table. Something's going to snap. Pretty sure I'm the only bear in this town. I try for a smile and almost hit the mark. Well, Jack continues, his expression stern, we knew Norman was selling or expanding, but now that they've been suddenly chased out of town, there's no way to know where any of them went. He's probably picking his business up somewhere else, where we'll never find him, and Eli's lost the only family he has. Jack's tone grew sharper as he spoke, his eyes still boring into Kit's face even though he continues to glance at our joined hands. I'm worried for a minute he might start yelling. Eli drains the rest of his glass and abruptly stands up, the table shaking as he pushes himself out from under it. He mutters that he's getting another beer, and Jack immediately lets go of all the pretense that he's not furious at Kit. He leans across the table, talking in an angry hiss. When I said it was a good idea that you bring your mother here to help, I thought you meant help keep us safe, not just murder random members of Norman's staff and run him out of town. His fingers are clenched tight around his water glass as he speaks. What the fuck was the point of this? Norman's gone, no one has been saved, nothing's been uncovered, and people are dead. I know Briar's a piece of shit just like the rest of them, but he was everything that Eli had. Eli, 
who is a fucking good guy, by the way. These assholes need to be stopped, not fucking murdered. Call me old-fashioned, or whatever. Jack finally leans back in his seat, letting out a deep, tense breath. Kid is staring up at him with frightened eyes, and I can't stop myself from rubbing my hand over their shoulders. This isn't Kit's fault, I hiss, but it only makes Jack give me a humorless smile. Ah, so they did tell you the truth. You guys must be doing a lot more than just holding hands. I can feel my temper flare. Jack is supposed to be Kit's friend, and none of this is making the situation any better. Fuck you, Jack. Kit's not responsible for their lunatic mother's actions, and they've lost more than anything to this nightmare, so why don't you back off? I barely contain my growl, and I can hear the challenge in my voice. Jack doesn't back down, he's not easily intimidated. But he doesn't attack, either. His friend is hurting, and he's had to lead his babies to come out and deal with it. Maybe I need to cut him some slack. In my life, I've never seen Kit this quiet. This small. They look like they want the earth to swallow them whole, and not even my touch is getting any kind of response. Eventually, they take in a deep breath, and I can hear the steel creep into their voice. I think my time here is over. That's all they say. No explanation, no detail, they just say it and then stand up from the table. My hand falls away from their shoulder, and they don't even look at me as they walk out of the building. I want to say something. I'm not even sure what just happened. Whatever it was, it felt like something big shifted. My mouth is hanging open as I look back at Jack, who looks just as confused, and Kit is in the wind. Maddie. At some point in the night, Kit fills me in on what they were actually arguing with their mother about. Today, she's taking her people, I asked Kit if I should call them soldiers, but they rolled their eyes at me and snorted, to raid Norman's property. They've been collecting shreds of evidence all month and have used their political connections to get a right to search warrant. It seems wildly illegal that a private entity can be allowed to search someone's property, but corruption in this country isn't exactly news to me. I try to brush past the thought. Despite my immediate distaste for the woman, at least Kit's mother cared enough to ban them from the raid. I know a little about what had happened to their brother. The few things that have been whispered to me in a thick, pained voice in the darkest hours of the night. There's something about that quiet intimacy that makes it easier to talk. It's dark and silent, the two of you huddled under the blankets, feeling like you're the only people in the world. Outside of those moments, Kid has never mentioned a word of it, but I've picked up enough to know how much of a hole he left in their life. Which means they would be physically incapable of going to that place without doing themselves damage, physical or otherwise. I don't want them anywhere near it. They already acquiesced to their mother, even if it was grudgingly, so my mission is to keep them distracted enough that they don't get worked up and change their mind. I devote all of my energy into giving them something to pour all that pent-up energy into. Such burdens I carry. Kid is twitchy when we wake up, and tense, but I give them the longest, slowest blow job I can manage until at least a fraction of that tension has eased. They come down my throat with one hand in my hair, and they smile at me with naked affection when I look up. There's sadness there too, but the affection is what matters. I kiss them deeply, and then pull them downstairs to make us pancakes and bacon, all drenched in honey. Later on, I make a point of being just bratty enough to draw their attention. I refuse to stop, even though I'm normally pretty easily placated, and eventually all that simmering anger gets turned on me. But it's Kit, so the anger turns into a desire to control, which turns into a desire to service, as per usual. They bring me to the brink of orgasm, only to ruin it so many times I'm a weeping mess by the end of it. Afterwards, they let me lie in their lap while they hand feed me pieces of fruit, and I like to think some contentment settles in us both. It goes like that. I ignore all my responsibilities, for once, too focused on keeping Kit safe to care. Kit knows what I'm doing, so they spend the day frustrated and irritable, but at least I can give them an outlet for it that doesn't involve breaking and entering. Whatever happens, we don't turn on the news. By the end of the day, we're both exhausted, physically, and emotionally. We need to get out of the house. In an effort to stay away from everyone we know, 
we head to the dirty dog instead of going into town. It's loud and crowded with a faint smell of cheap beer, but the atmosphere is cheerful and the loud music is blowing most of the thoughts out of my brain. This was an excellent idea. Apparently, we're also both too tired to remember the rules of being in public. Until now, we've kept the touchy-feely stuff strictly private. But what can I say? It's been a long-ass day and I want to hold Kit's hand at the bar. I lean over and order us both a drink. Kit is unusually quiet, their face drawn, eyes flicking from side to side as they shift their weight. They squeeze my hand like it's a lifeline. Don't worry, I turn and murmur in their ear, these people are very live and let live. No one cares if you're wearing eyeliner. A huff of air escapes Kit's face, and the derisive glare they give me is the most emotion I've gotten in a couple of hours. It fades quickly though, and then they're back to looking drained. I wait a second to see if they'll say something else with no success. But, as soon as I turn my attention back to the bar, I hear a soft voice. I haven't been here since I came with Cole. My brain is cycling through every word in the English language at warped speed, desperate to find the right thing to say. But there isn't anything. Instead, I move closer and place a tender kiss on their temple. We lean on each other, just for a moment, and when we pull apart, I think that some of that sadness has eased. When we turn around to find somewhere to sit, drinks in hand, there's a set of eyes staring at us from across the room. Shit. I forgot Jack liked to come here. But either way, shouldn't he be at home right now? Instead of staring at Kit and me with a level of shock that makes me feel raw and exposed. It's too late to take it back now. We head over to the table and help ourselves to some seats. Jack continues to stare, and I refuse to let go of Kit's hand. There's someone sitting with Jack, a younger, rough-looking guy, but he doesn't seem to have any interest in the sudden tension. He sips his beer and continues to gaze at the wall with a thousand-yard stare. I thought you'd be at home with the pups, Jack. What's going on? If I sound concerned, it's because I am. I've rarely seen an Omega leave the nest this soon after birth, and especially not one that's as obsessed with caretaking as Jack. Something must be really wrong. Jack is still staring at me and Kit, frowning, but then he snaps out of it and fixes those amber eyes on mine. I was too busy having a minor meltdown to notice before, but he looks heartbroken. Something in me sinks at the thought. Are they Dash? They're fine, he reassures me. William's with them. I just had to step out for a minute. Eli, he turns and indicates the man sitting next to him, who is still not looking at us, he had some bad news this morning. I wanted to make sure he was all right. Jack reaches over and slaps his friend on the shoulder, giving it a tight squeeze. Eli stiffens at the touch. He looks like every stereotype about people who live in trailer parks, unshaven with dark, unkempt hair. He's wearing a sleeveless leather jacket that shows off lean, defined muscle. The kind of muscle someone has when they never set foot in a gym but can feel dress a deer with their eyes closed. It fits the profile that casual physical contact between friends might not be what he's used to. But when I sniff the air, I realize that it's not Jack's Omega I was smelling. I mean, it is, but it's his friend as well. Hmm, interesting. Also, as much as he stiffened up when Jack initially touched him, he's softening under the persistent touch. I'm suddenly seeing what this man and Jack might have in common. I'm sorry to hear that, Kit speaks for the first time in a while, what happened? Jack waves his hand around, we don't have to dash, but Eli opens his mouth and cuts him off. M brother ran out, left town this morning. His voice is quiet and deep, his words straight to the point. His shoulders are hunched up tight around his ears, and he still hasn't made a contact with anyone at this table. His brother is Briar, he's the foreman over at Norman's place, there's a steely look in Jack's eye as he speaks, and he flicks his tongue over his lips. It looks like something got over the fence line this morning, maybe a bear. Neither of us looks at Kit when he says it. The whole place was torn apart, he continues, two of them were taken by surprise, found dead. The rest of the staff have disappeared. Eli goes back to staring at the wall with a pained expression. 
Jack pins Kit with his eyes. You wouldn't know about any aggressive bears in the area, would you, Kit? There's a long, tense silence, but Eli seems to be too wrapped up in his repressed emotion to notice. Thankfully, Jack and Kit are staring each other down like they're in a western, and I'm doing my best not to feel adrift in something I'll never fully understand. Or maybe you do, Maddie. Jack whips his head to look at me. Have you seen any bears around? I take a deep breath and let it out slowly. There's too much tension at this table. Something's going to snap. Pretty sure I'm the only bear in this town. I try for a smile and almost hit the mark. Well, Jack continues, his expression stern, we knew Norman was selling or expanding, but now that they've been suddenly chased out of town, there's no way to know where any of them went. He's probably picking his business up somewhere else, where we'll never find him, and Eli's lost the only family he has. Jack's tone grew sharper as he spoke, his eyes still boring into Kit's face even though he continues to glance at our joined hands. I'm worried for a minute he might start yelling. Eli drains the rest of his glass and abruptly stands up, the table shaking as he pushes himself out from under it. He mutters that he's getting another beer, and Jack immediately lets go of all the pretense that he's not furious at Kit. He leans across the table, talking in an angry hiss. When I said it was a good idea that you bring your mother here to help, I thought you meant help keep us safe, not just murder random members of Norman's staff and run him out of town. His fingers are clenched tight around his water glass as he speaks. What the fuck was the point of this? Norman's gone, no one has been saved, nothing's been uncovered, and people are dead. I know Briar's a piece of shit just like the rest of them, but he was everything that Eli had. Eli, who is a fucking good guy, by the way. These assholes need to be stopped, not fucking murdered. Call me old-fashioned, or whatever. Jack finally leans back in his seat, letting out a deep, tense breath. Kid is staring up at him with frightened eyes, and I can't stop myself from rubbing my hand over their shoulders. This isn't Kit's fault, I hiss, but it only makes Jack give me a humorless smile. Ah, so they did tell you the truth. You guys must be doing a lot more than just holding hands. I can feel my temper flare. Jack is supposed to be Kit's friend, and none of this is making the situation any better. Fuck you, Jack. Kit's not responsible for their lunatic mother's actions, and they've lost more than anything to this nightmare, so why don't you back off? I barely contain my growl, and I can hear the challenge in my voice. Jack doesn't back down, he's not easily intimidated. But he doesn't attack, either. His friend is hurting, and he's had to lead his babies to come out and deal with it. Maybe I need to cut him some slack. In my life, I've never seen Kit this quiet. This small. They look like they want the earth to swallow them whole, and not even my touch is getting any kind of response. Eventually, they take in a deep breath, and I can hear the steel creep into their voice. I think my time here is over. That's all they say. No explanation, no detail, they just say it and then stand up from the table. My hand falls away from their shoulder, and they don't even look at me as they walk out of the building. I want to say something. I'm not even sure what just happened. Whatever it was, it felt like something big shifted. My mouth is hanging open as I look back at Jack, who looks just as confused, and Kit is in the wind. Kit. Maddie is kneeling on the floor next to where I sit on the couch. He's naked, hands behind his back, facing me with his head bowed. His eyes are closed, and his expression is the most peaceful, contented thing I've ever seen. I reach out, a small, ripe piece of plum between my fingers, and place it in his mouth. He licks the juice from my fingers as he takes it. The feeling of his tongue on my skin is something I've felt a thousand times, and I don't think I'll ever get sick of it. Good boy, I purr, watching as he chews and swallows methodically. Pride swells up in me. Maddie may seem calm on the outside, but it's mostly because he talks slowly and is so very lumbering and large. Internally, I've come to learn. He's always moving a mile a minute. I've devoted an enormous amount of time and energy to making him slow down, and every time I see him succeed, I could burst with pride. 
Hand feeding has become a favorite for both of us. I'll feed him, piece by tiny piece, and then as soon as he's come down to a calm place I'll give him the longest, most luxurious blow job I can, or I'll fuck him so deep and so slow that he comes over and over, sobbing into the mattress with the feeling of it. Not today, though. Today, Matty is tired, and I want him to sleep. He overscheduled himself for how many orders he could fill in two weeks, despite my stern objections. Then, when it became clear how impossible a task it was, he decided to have a meltdown instead of doing something to fix it. Which I get. Failure is not an option childhoods don't leave a lot of room for letting things like that go. So, instead, he barely slept for a week and a half and continued to power through until everything was done. Afterwards, I put him in chastity as his punishment for not taking care of himself. It probably seems straightforward to him, a punishment for bad behavior. But really, it gives me the chance to swap out his orgasms for the things he needs more right now. Things that will help him rest. Things like this. He falls asleep with a belly full of fruit and his sticky face resting on my thigh. It's absolutely worth it. Maddie. Kit's always grumpy when they wake up. I don't really get it, how they can just lie in bed all day, slowly letting themselves reattach their brain to reality. It makes me feel antsy being that still for that long. But I love them, and they don't get, too, upset when I wake them up early so I can go to the bees, so I try to compromise. Right now, they're drifting in and out of wakefulness, drooling a little on my shoulder. Their half-hard cock is pressed against my thigh and I'm definitely going to take advantage of that in a minute. But first, I have a question. Kit, wake up. I shake my shoulder, making them groan in protest. I had a dream and I need to ask you about it. What the hell is it, mountain man? Shouldn't you be outside hunting muskrats for our breakfast? Their voice is a sleepy growl, and they don't bother to open their eyes. Do you ever want children, Kit? Straight into the point. The words are out of me before I even realize it. Now their eyes are definitely open. They raise their head, just enough to look at me with tense, sleepy eyes. They try to hide it, but they scent the air before they speak. What are you trying to tell me, Sven? No, no, not that. I shake my head, realizing how it must have sounded, I just mean, ever? Is that something you ever want? Kid sighs and I can hear their hesitation when they answer. Honestly, I never really have, Maddie. I know it's serious whenever they use my actual name. I hated my family so much, and I practically raised Cole Dash, their voice breaks a little on his name, but they push through. I always sort of assumed I was done with all of that. When Kit looks back at me, there's vulnerability shining in their eyes. Fuck, I didn't mean for it to come out like that, and now they look like I'm about to break up with them. I'm sorry. I should really have told you before we got together, I guess. They lift themselves off of me, emotion clouding their face. I react on instinct and grab them, yanking them back down and smushing their face into my chest. I didn't mean it like that, you moron, I say. I just mean. It's hard to articulate. The closer it comes to real human words, the dumber I think it sounds. I'm kind of in the same boat. Family was always more of a burden to me. It wasn't something I wanted to saddle someone else with. Kit looks at me, now more confused than scared. It's just. I was hanging out with Jack and Eli down at the dog yesterday. We were a little drunk, okay, I was a little drunk. They were both shit-faced because Jack was celebrating the fact that he wasn't nursing anymore Dash. Kit interrupts with a snort, yeah, I seriously doubt he's done nursing, but the pups, maybe. Anyway, they were both talking about their awful, lonely fucking childhoods. Especially since Eli's brother left. I mean, two Omegas, already outliers in society because of how they look. No role models other than hypermasculine alphas who drift in and out of their lives. I mean, they're both adults, I know. They're finding their own way in the world. But I can't help but think about how much easier it would have been if they had someone to help them when they were younger. I fall silent, but Kit waits patiently. I dunno. 
I was thinking it might be nice to find a way to help kids like them. Young, abandoned Omegas. You know? Sorry, I'm rambling. This doesn't make any sense. Kit's entire face warms as they look at me, and they stretch upwards to press their lips against mine. Just briefly, a small kiss. Like it's a habit. I think that's a lovely idea, Maddie. Maybe one day we can. Yeah? I look back at them with a goofy smile. As long as you're talking about actual pups, not huskies, because I have no desire to raise a sled team with you, whether they need a home or not. I don't dignify that with a laugh, but it makes me snort. Something warm and fierce is swelling up inside me. It's becoming familiar now. I've felt it more and more since the day everything with Kit started. Now that your very specific question about the very distant future is over with, can I go back to sleep? Sure, baby, go to sleep. I close my eyes and enjoy the feeling of Kit wriggling back into place, curled around my side. What I really want to do is roll over and let them fuck me until I scream, but they're right, it's still early. I can wake them up again in an hour.